Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Welcome to the Pool Chasers Podcast. This is episode six. In this episode, we get to interview Jeremy Noggle of Premier Paradise. He's actually the first builder that we're going to have on the podcast. So we're very excited for you guys to be able to listen alongside of us and learn. As you guys know, we are a pool service and repair company, so we don't really get into the building side. And we get to be more fanboys on this episode, so it's been really fun putting this together for you guys. Um, We had so much fun with Jeremy, and we respect him so much. He's a leader in the industry. He's doing a lot of really good things to make this industry better. Jeremy and Premier were one of the few we discussed having on the podcast in the very beginning because his sleek designs are unique every time. He never builds the same pool twice. If you go on their Instagram, Facebook, website, you can definitely see what they're doing. You can definitely see that it's different, and you can definitely see how professional it is. We get into quite a bit of the design side of things, and we got to learn so much, and we hope you guys get to learn alongside us. So let's get started, and we hope you guys enjoy it. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Jeremy. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. We know you're extremely busy with the family and a thriving pool building uh, company, um, as well as all the other activities you have going on. So we really appreciate you uh, being here with us today. Yeah, I greatly appreciate you guys even asking. So, you know, thanks for what you're doing for the industry. It's, it's a good thing. Thank you very much, Jeremy. We appreciate that. And I know from the very beginning, when we even thought we were going to do the podcast, um, we put a huge list together of all the different um, companies and people that we wanted on the show. And right away, I think you were like number one or two that we wanted to be on the show because you're here in Arizona and we just had, you know, so much respect for the, you know, the style pools you're building and just what you're doing uh, for the pool industry. And we always just you know, had nothing but respect for you. So, um, it's a, it's a real honor to have you on here. Well, thank you. Yeah. So can you please, um, just introduce yourself to our listeners and what you do exactly? Yeah. I'm, my name is Jeremy Noggle. I'm based out of Gilbert, Arizona. I'm the owner of Premier Paradise out here in Arizona and we build swimming pools. Very good. You build like luxury <laughs> swimming pools, custom <laughs> swimming pools, beautiful pools. Try to. Yeah, very cool. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, maybe some of the hobbies you know that you have? I know of a couple, but love to hear uh, just a little bit more background on your family, and then we'll go back in time a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you say family and hobbies, and I think right now my family is my hobby. <laughs> For um, sure. All I get to do is work and then family, and uh, you know, the family is what helps me just shut everything off. You know, put the phone on the counter, go home, and take care of the kids, but... I have three kids. I have two daughters, a 15-year-old, seven-year-old girls, and then I have a four-year-old boy and a wife of uh, 10 years as of last week. Oh, nice. Congratulations nice. Thank to you both much. of you. Thank you. Very cool. How is that having a teenage daughter? I'm only asking because I got a, a five-year-old and a, <laughs> and a two-year-old, and I don't, I don't know what I'm in for here. Yeah. Uh, you asked me 15 years ago when I found out I was having one, and um, I was terrified, man. I was absolutely scared. Uh but my wife, I think, seeing how grounded she is, seeing how well raised she is, her her morals, her values, her ethics, it's just uh, she's instilled that into my 15-year-old. So I know that she's going to make good decisions. She's got a good head on her shoulders. And whatever she gets into, I'm just here to here to back her up. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. That's that's really the way to be. Unfortunately, some of us didn't have the greatest upbringing. So yeah. it's uh, sometimes we find that partner in life and we really depend on them to, you know, really just help raise the kids. And then, we, you know, they lead by example and it makes us better uh, in return. So that's, I, I that's really cool. Um, so. This we're gonna go back way back in time, um, kind of talking about childhood and things like that. Um, we really think that the things that we experienced as a kid really make who we are uh, in the future. So, you want to talk to us a little bit about you know you know where you grew up, maybe around you know what decade that was in, and just you know take us down uh, memory take us lane. down that memory lane. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Southern California. Uh, I don't know why I moved. Actually, I know why I moved. My parents moved me out here with them. But uh, I grew up with two brothers, an older brother, three years older than me, named Steve. And we were we're still to this day close. He's my stepbrother. 
it's probably why we're so close because there's no blood getting in the mix. <laughs> so he's more like a best friend to me. Um, my my mom or his mom had him with someone else. My dad had me. They got married and had my little brother. So I have a half brother and a step brother, and my little brother's obviously the half brother. So we grew up in Redlands, California, sometime in Riverside, but we spent most of our time in Redlands, California, up until I was about a freshman in, in high school, and then we moved out to Arizona. Okay. And what what year was that when you were in California? Was that back in the 90s? Uh, well, or? I was born in 79. Okay. Um, and lived there up until 94. Like okay. 94, yeah. Okay. Very cool. And my uh, grand, the reason why we're from California is my grandfather, my great grandfather started Noggles and was a huge part of Del Taco back in the day. So that's why we have the Southern California, you know, influence from down there. And just that's where we end up staying. And then once he sold the restaurants, we kind of just packed up and moved out to Arizona. Dude, that is so crazy. I think me and you <laughs> might have some, that some is. connection there because my yeah. family has, uh, some stuff to do with some of the earlier beginnings of Del Taco at yeah. Barstow. Yeah. So the one wow. in Barstow still serves the Noggles menu. Oh, really? Yeah. The one in Barstow still serves that. Yeah. My grandfather, my great grandfather was in Del Tacos in 1965. Oh, wow. So some of the first ones that opened up, he was a, he was a major influencer of it. He worked in Naval, uh, in the Naval or Armed Force kitchens back in the day when, when he was young and he knew how, a ship should run. He knew how things should be clean. He knew how stuff should be served fast, fresh, and just taking care of the people in front of you. And, but if you know the armed forces, they are regimented. Things are set up with, you know, mm -hmm. processes and things are done a certain way. So when he got into working for Del, for Del Taco, he basically wanted to go in there and reinvent their setups. He wanted to do 24 hour drive throughs. He wanted to do all these different things. And they told him, you're nuts. <laughs> you know, none of this stuff's ever going to work. Who the hell eats at midnight? <laughs> you know, so anyhow, he later on basically went out and started one of his own, um, called it Noggles after us, named after after himself, and that went from one Noggles to two to three, and then ended up getting purchased out by a guy named Harold Butler, who's uh, the founder of Coco's and Mimi's Cafe oh, okay. and, and everything, and he ended up meeting him on a cruise, and the shyster talked him into <laughs> franchising and... <laughs> Everything else, and at that time, my grand, my great grandfather was older, and he kind of was just done with, you know, the rat race. He wanted someone to come in and really help him with it. He still loved going and meeting all of his employees and shaking the hands and doing everything, but it just got to be so much that at his age, he wanted someone to come in and help. Signed a deal up, sold it for not nearly enough money, and the guy <laughs> opened up three, four hundred of them all across the country. Oh wow! And just as fast as they opened, they shut down. Oh wow! And Basically, Del Taco came in and purchased it from him and turned all the noggles into Del Taco, and that's how they got. All, was it like a similar that. menu, or it was a well? No, he Del Taco had a menu with you know the hamburgers and the Mexican and American, but he really took it to another level with the sizes of what he was serving. You know, large burritos, sure, breakfast burritos being open twenty four hours. Um, pineapple shakes, just going off the cup, you know, blackberry sodas, just doing stuff that he wanted, not what he thought the public wanted. And people loved that. It wasn't like any other, you know, serving Coke and serving burgers and serving fries. He offered so much more. That had to have been so huge back then because, you know, back in the day, it was all portion control. Like it was normal to eat like a normal human being. You ate a little cheeseburger, you had a little fry, and that's what everybody ate. And now it's like, dude, like what is that? So what is? I need I need five I of need those, three or four of those. Yeah, yeah. So I need <laughs> yeah. two so, large. This like it's it's unreal now. So it's my family's fault. We're aware. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Partly. We appreciate it, man. Yep, I'll take it. These weight issues. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, so let's touch on just, you know, how things were as a kid. I mean, did you grow up long enough in Redlands to where, you know, did, did your family have money? Were you kind of middle class? Were you, you know, maybe a little bit uh, on the poor side? You no, know, what was it? We were broke. Um, my mom used to make my, my shorts, my clothes. Um, I used to get hand-me-down shirts. My dad would come home with the shoes that I was going to wear. You know, I, there was no choice in anything. It was just what it was. It was embarrassing to go to school. You know, as a young kid, it's just, it was what it was. You know, I just thought that's how life was. I thought that's how kids were raised. I thought that's just what everybody had. And uh, when I started getting a little bit older after, you know, third, fourth grade, and I started seeing that 
nobody else has shorts made by their mom that are bright pink. <laughs> that yeah. This isn't normal, you right. know. And uh, I started to really just pull back from everything. And I had my friends, they were my friends, but I was always embarrassed to be around people, you know, because of what I what I was and what my family was. You know, they're alcoholics, drunks, smoked cigarettes in the house. It was, you know, it was a terrible upbringing. You know, I, I didn't realize that until later in life that, that wasn't normal. This is not normal. I thought everybody did that. I thought everybody went to school smelling like cigarettes. You know, I thought everybody's parents drank themselves to sleep. I thought everybody's parents woke up at 4 in the morning to go to work and came home at 7 at night while we were feeding ourselves and taking care of ourselves. You know, the classic Lasky kid yeah. sort of syndrome. And it wasn't that way. You know, getting my ass kicked by my dad for not taking the garbage out when he never asked me to do it. He just expected it to be done. Sure. And, I mean, daily beatings from, from your parents. You know, so it was far from normal but to me it was normal yeah and that's really sad i mean did you get to a certain point where you were just really looking forward to being independent being out on your own and just kind of building a new life because you started to figure out that that wasn't normal i mean you had some friends that had probably what you call a normal household and it's like you know what that's what i need and that's what i want i'm tired of you know being in this place you know i, I think where i came from that i wasn't the only one that had uh, parents that were Lasky kid syndrome. I, I went home. I didn't get to see how parents raised their kids were in, in my neighborhood. We were all kids that went home by ourselves, did our homework if we did our homework, and ran outside and played hang and seek and roller skated until dark, ate dinner, and then watched The Simpsons and went to bed. You know, that was just life. Yeah. And I didn't get to see how other people raised their kids, not once, because I'm, I mean, I'm a kid, I'm in a zone. Right. I just want to have fun and hang out with the kids, and I want to stay away from my house because there's nothing fun inside of my house once those doors closed. Sure. You know, here in my my brother and I joked about it even last week, you know, driving home or sitting at the house playing hang go seek or whether we're in the garage doing something and hearing my dad's truck turn around the corner. And it's just like, oh, shit. You yeah. Know, what did we do wrong today? What did, What happened now? What's this? And it's just like as a kid, you'd have, you know, just this terrible feeling in your gut as soon as you heard your, your dad's truck pull around the corner. And so for me, I just getting away from it, I don't think any of that came to mind until high school because I didn't feel like there was any way out. I just felt like I got to stick with this. If I don't, I get my ass chewed or get my ass beat. So I just got to stick with this until whatever works out is supposed to work out. And I had no clue. My parents had no plans. My parents didn't teach me about anything. And I'm self-taught with everything that I know. Sure. Were you a good student or were you just kind of a class clown? Like what was your style in school? I always w was a class clown. I always liked to make people laugh, um, but it was more or less just to detract from what's going on in my own life. The only, only time I had fun was at school. It was around my friends. It, it wasn't when I was at home. So I really used that time to, to try to enjoy myself and have fun with my friends. And it was about when is class getting out to walk to the next class so I could talk to my friends for 10 minutes between class. Right. And it was that, but I still had a 3.7 all the way up through, you know, my, my sophomore, junior year when I just got tired of school. I moved from California out to Gilbert or Gilbert, Arizona, and schooling systems out here are completely different. School in California is way harder than it is out here, but at least back, you know, when I, when I transferred over here. And I remember having what, eight or nine classes out in California coming out here and only having six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. getting out early and going to school, you know, when the sun was up and not you know, going <laughs> walking to school when it's dark. And it was for me, it was easy. And I felt like I had more time. And in doing that, instead of applying myself, I just put myself in the wrong direction with the wrong people and ended up just quit caring about school and dropped out my senior year. I only had three classes as I carried a 3.7, had three classes and one of them was weightlifting. And just lost complete interest in school. And at that time, my dad had kicked me out of the house. My parents got divorced. My dad only really cared about himself and work. So kicked me out of the house. I had no place to go. So I decided to get a job and move in with some guys. And they were like 20-some years old. I'm 15, 16 years old at the time. And uh, moved in with them, so I had a place to stay and slept on their couch in an apartment complex and gave them 150 bucks a month to help them with rent. And so I was working at a Dairy Queen on Gilbert Road in Juniper. Nice. <laughs> still there. I still go there. Check it out. Get your blizzards. <laughs> I still go there. 
<laughs> I used to make so many blizzards wrong so I could crush those things when that's still my favorite oh, ice yeah. cream. Yeah. yeah. Blizzards still you can't beat it. Yeah. Because oh, you, can. you can't because you can't give them the wrong thing, yeah. so you just put it when aside. You, when you did the upside down <laughs> test, it fell yeah. out. Yeah. All the time. All I was, I was feeding, I was living on blizzards. Oh man, that's and awesome. chocolate dip cones. Those are those oh, are yeah. oh, yeah. I like the cherry dip ones <laughs> too. Yeah, They're good too. Those are good too. Yeah. But no, I uh got a job and started working and that when I learned about money and making money, that was really was important to me was just figured out that, you know, school's not for me. Anytime I'd ask my parents for help with homework, I don't know if it's because they didn't understand it, but you ask them a question about something and they start screaming about you. How come you didn't pay attention in class? How come you don't retain it? How come you don't understand it? It's like the guy's teaching 32 people. I, I got one hour with the guy. I'm coming home. And I'm asking you a question. Help me out. You know, screaming at me and hitting me because I don't know the answer to a question. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And so I just rejected the whole thing altogether. Definitely. And how how come your parents moved out to Arizona? What was the reason? Work? Uh, my dad, well, we had a 1,700-square-foot house in California. And that house was, at the time, back in 93, 94, sold for $190,000. He came out here and bought a Blanford home in his very first neighborhood next to the islands, the Cocopelli Golf Course, El Dorado Lakes. And they bought a home in there that was 4,200 square feet, totally unreasonable size for what we had going on. <laughs> and they paid 170 grand for it. So that was wow. a done deal. Wow. Plus, he, he used to sell construction equipment, and one of his customers were out here. And we came out to, to, to hang out with them. We came on, made it a family trip, and it was in uh, March when everything's beautiful. Right. <laughs> and we moved out here in August. When it's a nightmare. Yep. That's so and, rough. you know, but, um, yeah, so that's when we moved out here. And it was uh, my sophomore, junior year, part through, through my sophomore year and started my full junior year out here at Gilbert High School. That is seriously insane. We have a lot in common. Yeah. I did the same thing from Vegas to California, um, just to kind of share this with you a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I came out around, I left, yeah, my sophomore year at the end yeah, of the sophomore the year. Of sophomore. And uh, I met him at a Christian school. I was going to go to another public school. And uh, I actually got kicked out of the school before <laughs> I could even start there. Um, so my mom's like, dude, you're going to this Christian school. So I ended up going and I met Tyler. And a bunch of stuff happened where I ended up getting kicked out. And uh, his family was so gracious to uh, pretty much adopt me and bring me in and take me under their wing. And it was like the greatest thing. But it was pretty much around, you know, the same time in my life where I was, you know, 15, 16 years sure. old and it was a critical time and, you know, that little piece of my life and, you know, a lot of other things, but that was one of the biggest pieces that really kind of made me who I am and made me a little bit more independent. And, you know, there's some trust issues that come in there, but ultimately there's all these different things that we go through that kind of make us who we are. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And I believe that, you know, all that stuff you went through, you know, is all leading up to all the stuff we're about to talk about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Who would you say, you know, you got to a point, did you have a mentor? Was there a family relative? Or was there anybody your earlier years, maybe at the end of high school, was there just that one person that you connected with that just kind of kept your head above water, I guess you'd say? No. Honestly, no, I don't think I really had mentors or understood that I needed to have something like that in my life probably until as recent as five years ago. You know, really it was just me. I had my my daughter when I was 23 years old. With Dated a girl in high school, miserable girl in high school. I hope she's listening. And, um, <laughs> What's her name? We'll, we'll tag her in. Oh, it. yeah, I'm let's blow her up. <laughs> no, but... Um, She's just a miserable person, you know, and I dated her in high school and she had the same kind of upbringing, though, you know, um, but uh, I think that's pretty common, though, when you you just yeah. flock to those same kind of people that yeah, it, it's same stuff you're going through. It's a magnet. Sure. You know, I, I, yeah, it's a magnet. But um, dated her through high school, left her, went to California just to kind of get away from everything that was going on and start over out in California, which is a bad mistake when you have no money. <laughs> yes, um, very bad. Especially very California. Bad. Yeah, especially California. Yeah, you got to go like Montana or something if you have no yeah, money. Yeah, <laughs> go, go to the woods. Yeah. But um, so anyhow, I went uh, went back to California, came back to about two, well, I went to Henderson, lived in Henderson, Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, spent two years up there with my older brother. He was cutting concrete and asphalt at the time um, for one of the largest cutting companies up there. So I went and stayed with him for, well, I went and partied with him for about three years, two, three years had to get out of that scene and basically came back to Arizona and lo and behold I have a party at my parents house 
or my mom's house because I was living with my mom. They were already separated, but I was living with my mom. She was newly married. Um, had a party while she was gone. She didn't care. And uh, she shows up. <laughs> I'm drunk. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I miss you so much. And because <laughs> you're drunk and didn't realize all the shit she put me through in my life uh, while I was with her. And um, we ended up hooking up for a few months right when we're finding right when I'm basically telling her that I'm done. Let's get out of here. She's pregnant. Mm. And so, I mean, I was smoking cigarettes at the time and drinking and, and whatnot. And I remember the, the day that my, my daughter was born, it just all went out the window. I threw it all away. You know, I threw really? my cigarettes out. The day she came out, I was just like, all right. You know, I got, okay, time to grow up. Yeah. yeah. Time to do something. Before she was born, I had a conversation with her mom and said, as soon as this girl's six months old, you're done. Like, we're, we're gone. I'm, I'll stay with you. I'll support you. We'll, we'll take care of this. But six months, hit the bricks. You know, you're out of here. I'll go my way. You go your way. We'll figure out everything with the kid. And I want to make sure I'm, I'm there for her and I'm in her life a lot. And I was. I mean, I had, I had custody for a good amount of time, about four or five years, where I had 100% custody of her. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, They stay out here in Arizona? Yeah. Yeah, well, she moved for a little while, and that's why I'm getting custody. The judge, there's no way. She's got a happy life down here. She loves her dad. She's staying in here. You know, she's got great grades. She's in honors classes. There's no way we're taking her away from, from what's going on down here. Oh, very cool. And I still took her to see her, 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 her grandma. You know, her grandma stayed down here, her mom's mom. And I still took her over there and invited her to birthday parties. She came to all the different school functions. You know, I still kept them very involved because uh, she's a very important person in her life. So I made sure that all still happened. But uh, I'd have to say... My daughter, Aubrey, is probably the first person that pushed me to be somebody. Yeah, that was your first mentor? Oh, yeah. Very cool. There's something that I think comes over all of us when you have your first kid. You know, I think if you're a, a good parent or you're just kind of paying attention to life, I think there's just something that when they're here, you just shape up real quick. Yeah. You're just like, dude, it's me and you against the world. Well, some people do. Some people do, yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. If you're, one, if the good ones. If you're yeah. a good parent and you want to change, and I think if you've been through a lot of crappy situations um i know me i i was getting my first daughter out of the town we grew up in mm -hmm. and there was nothing in this world that would stop me yeah nothing that's awesome so very cool i think it also probably gave you like you know the opportunity of like a second chance you know because you probably realized by that point same with you that like there's nothing in this world that's going to keep me from you know giving my daughter or yeah. my son a better life and yeah. you realize at that point like okay well now i can be a man and show this little human being what they're supposed to be like and what their life's supposed to be like i think there's that's what i think makes a big difference you know yeah and to be completely honest man i'm i wasn't always there in the beginning because i had to work and struggle and do what i did whatever the excuse is it's not a good one but i would you know sometimes call up and say hey i can't i'm not going to be able to pick her up tomorrow you need to do this you need to do that because I was trying to, you know, get my shit together and I was taking care of myself living in an apartment while she's just moved in with her mom. Right. Had a full time babysitter, was able to do that. I didn't have that. My right. parents were gone. Right. You know, I don't I don't I didn't have any of that stuff. So I wasn't always there, but I quickly realized when I started dating my wife, because I started dating my wife about uh, when Aubrey was six months old. Oh wow. Right, because I like I said, I was already checking out. Yeah. I was checked out before she even found out she was pregnant. I started dating my wife at six months when she was six months old and she's the one when I went over and saw her family I was like oh this is not just on TV shows people are like this people love each other hug each other ask each other questions they sit around a dinner table what the okay and it, the air is fresh in the house there's no, there's yeah, no cigarette no smoke, smoke. <laughs> no smoke and um, it just she's the one who turned it around for me big time you know she's the one that made me realize what I needed to do in order to make sure this girl was brought up like how her family brought up their their daughters. Most definitely. So, yeah. That's but really cool. To answer your question, though, about mentor business-wise, one of my biggest mentors and someone I still lean on to this day is Buzz Giz, uh, the owner of Paramount. Oh, um, okay. And, you know, the family that started Paddock Pools. Yeah. Buzz Giz is probably one of the greatest guys in this industry. Um, really? Hands down. Um, hands down, the guy treats me like an equal at all times, and this guy's... You know, he's a staple in the industry in Arizona. And uh, I've always been able to reach out to him, talk to him about anything, sit down and break bread, business decisions. Should I get a loan? Should I not get a loan? I mean, the guy is an open book, and he's always taking care of me, and, and he's probably one of the biggest influences on how to treat people and how to run a business. 
Um, he's probably my biggest influence. That's Give awesome. him a shout out. Yeah, a little shout out. Very good. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so just one more quick question on the childhood. You, you still have a relationship with your with your parents? It's funny you say that. I actually just brought my mom into work for me. Um, oh, she wow. still does the same thing. Still, I mean, she'll probably hear this. I really don't care. Um, she drinks herself to sleep every night. You know, it's just her routine. Her dad did it too. She's you're you're a product of your upbringing. You know, um, she still smokes like a champ. You know, she um, she is who she is. I I love her to death. You know, I wish that she would change, but she's at this point in her life where I just need her. I brought her in so that she could be around. Yeah. You know, I don't care how good of an employee she is. She's not there for that. I'm basically paying her so I can have her around. And I know that when she's at my office from 7 to 5, 7 to 4, she's sober. Right. And I can communicate with her and talk to her. And see, my older brother works with me too, and so we basically have family in the office. And so that's the reason why I hired her and brought her on to do that. My dad, that guy's set up franchise. He set up another franchise in Texas, you know, their family. Yeah. I have brothers that are younger than my my kids, you know. Oh, wow. So oh. uh, he's he's a piece of shit, to be honest with you, to be frank. Um, yeah. So that communication's he, not there anymore? Nah, I, I could care less what happens to him, to be honest. I mean, it sounds pretty brutal, but he could care less what happened to me while I was growing up. So I got that same outlook. Sure. Um, I've tried to make amends multiple times. It always came down to him never doing anything wrong and poor me, poor me. And you're never going to grow or get out of that if you don't own up to what, what happened and just admit that you were a failure. But from here on out, let's move forward in a positive way. And I gave him multiple opportunities and just excuses after excuses and I'm not here to listen to him, you know? Um, so no, I don't talk to him. I wish him the best of luck. I hope his new kids are treated being better, treated better. I hope they're not getting their asses kicked every day. I hope that his wife keeps him in line and I hope he set up a good family over there, but I'm not interested in, yeah, in any of that. I'm sorry to hear that, man. It's all good. I'm dude. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy about it. It taught me how it taught me what not to do. Most definitely. That man taught me what not to do in life. He taught me, that failure is not an option because the guy failed at everything he did. He taught me, then don't ever raise your hand to your kids. Get down on their level and communicate with them. He just taught me. He taught me how to how to be a man by not being one. Sure, for sure, Most definitely. That's some real words of wisdom. You know, for everybody out there listening to this, if you're going through something, you can always get through it. There's not one of us that you know can't have a better life and have a better family and a better situation. It's just like everything else that becomes good in life. You just have to work really hard at it and you have to really want it. But you know, the grass is greener on the other side. If you really want it, if you just a hundred percent, if you want to go get it, it's out there waiting for you. It's not going to fall on your lap and it's not going to be easy at all. I failed daily, man. We all I, do. I failed daily. I had the worst year of my life sales wise of my company last year. Mm -hmm. I should have had the best year ever, but already this year I crushed last year. You know, I didn't want it bad enough last year. I thought I was on, I thought I was on cruise control. I thought it was going to take care of itself. I've been doing this for 10 years now. Yeah. And so I stepped out of it, you know, and I didn't manage the way I should and slapped me in the face and I want it more than I ever do, ever did before. Yeah. It makes you, know, you just makes you want it more when you, when you fall down. Yeah. For I, sure. I, re I realigned myself. That's awesome. And that's a good story. I really think that's going to help a lot of people motivate people. My, our dad has a similar story, so I can definitely relate to that. We, we, my family is, you know, like your wife's family. That's how, we were raised it's all loving hugging kissing you know we, I can tell we still, by looking at you <laughs> i'm sure you can <laughs> i can see it in your eyes yeah so you know i don't fully relate on that level to you guys but i get the opposite side because i saw him come in at 16 you know and, and we helped him and we, him and i have been through a lot of stuff a lot of hurt a lot of pain a lot of moments you know getting over those type of things so i think you know that's that's good all right so then Let's transition. So did you get your, did you get a GED? Did you, did you move yes. on? Yeah. Easiest thing I ever did, man. Um, when I moved from, uh, Vegas back out to, uh, Cal, I actually did a stop in California before I came back to Arizona and my mom was living out there at the time. She was sober. It's the best I ever saw her, man. She was, she was awesome. She had her own company. She was kicking ass and taking names. And I came back there, and she held me accountable. She said, you're going to come back in my house, or you're going to get your GED. So I didn't study. Went straight down over there, took it, passed it, got like a 98 or something <laughs> on it. It was nice. easy. I'm sitting there watching all these kids around me. 
and I take this test and I'm done like 30 minutes for everybody else. Yeah. And I, I told you, I was always good at school. Right. I'm common sense. Like I get the common sense. I can retain stuff. Mm-hmm. I, my mind's like a vault. But um, yeah, I passed that. Went and got my license because I my dad had my license revoked for five years. I wasn't able to get to my license uh, in Arizona and California until I was 21 years old because I had a party at my house. Oh, oh your wow. driver's license? Oh, yeah, really? I had a party at my house about two weeks before I turned 16. And I, we got busted for minor consumption. Oh, man. And uh, we went to court. My dad said, throw the book at him. What? Take him down. And the Sheesh. judge said, you want me to give him the max? He said, yeah. And so the guy took my license before I ever even had it. Wow. For five years. So the first time I was able to drive legally was 21. 21. Crazy. Wow. What was your first car? My first car was given to me by James Frabacilio, the at the time was a vice president at Presidential Pools. Um, awesome guy, really awesome guy. He uh, gave me his own truck when I became a when I moved up the ranks from service to construction. I went into doing sales. The sales guys didn't get vehicles at the time, and I was driving a company vehicle. That's the only reason why I could drive. So I told him, I said, James, you make me a salesperson, and I'm walking to people's houses. And he had an old truck that he was driving around. And he said, you know, it's time for me to get a new vehicle. Anyhow, you can have my truck. And he didn't have to pay a dollar for it. Gave it to me. Wow, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and that was, for me, that was life-changing when he did that for me. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm sure you were due for uh, some kind of favor. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a handout, huh? Yeah. For something, sure, help you up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so did, so you talk about presidentials. How, is that how you got into the industry? How did you start getting in the pool and spa industry? I started working in the industry um 99. I don't know. I'm wrong. It was uh, early 2000. It was right before September, as a year before September 11th happened. Okay. Um, and I got into uh, working at Pool Corp as a part-time job. I was oh. working at SCP 81 Gilbert. There you go. Shout out Russell. <laughs> Russell Long was my first manager. He's probably one of the greatest guys still to this day. I love that guy. I go see him. He's his, he's at working at the location and uh, Jermaine and Lindsay right across the street from me, and I go see him all the time. I absolutely love that guy. Um, I was working in the back warehouse part time, and he's like looking at me. I'm pulling parts for orders for all these companies. And he's, like, he said, "Jeremy, you're too smart for this. Go get up to the front counter. We're going to train you at the front counter." And I was up there working for a few weeks, meeting all these pool service guys. And I go, "Russ, can I come back to the back? <laughs> these guys are a bunch of assholes." <laughs> but uh, yeah, but um, no, I loved it, and uh, so I was one of my requirements again from my mom was that I got to do school too. She wanted me to go back to school. She was always on the school kick. And uh, and I think it's because she didn't get enough of it. You know, when she went, she knew how important it was. Um, so I signed up to MCC, got a full schedule to learn how to work on computers and blah, blah, blah. Go to my first class, and I'm 10 minutes late. And the professor, I walk in, you ever late to my class again, son, and you're out of here. And I said, well, I'll make this real easy for you. I'll see you later. And I walked out of class. I was just pissed. I was embarrassed. Sure. That's why. Yeah. Not sure. because of anything else. I didn't, I wanted to be in that class. He put you on blast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bunch of girls in the class. and Yeah, you can't have that, right? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn around. I walk out of that class. And I remember walking down. I got my money back. And I walked went over back. Saw Dave Esslinger. Said, Dave, I can be full-time now. You know, I'll come full-time. He hired me on full-time. And that was right when I had found out that uh, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant. So I needed the money anyhow. Yeah. And so I started doing full time. I was there for about eight months. And then uh, a guy named Bill Watson came in because they, they were presidential was on the rise big time. And uh, a guy named Bill Watson, who was the lead service guy over there, kept on coming. And I got a, I had built up a relationship with him because I'd pull the orders and do stuff. And I'd see five or six service techs come in. And he was the only one that I liked. You know, we, we, we got along real well. And he comes in one day and says, hey, we're hiring. You know, we're hiring. No, no, I'm not interested. I like my job. I don't want to go do something new. And then another guy came in that wasn't from Presidential. uh, And the company at the time was Canyon State Pools. And he asked me, you know, I'll pay you twice what you're making here. And I wasn't making hardly anything to come work for me and and do startups and help me this, that. I could use twice the money. Well, I didn't realize this company was already on the, was already going under. And he was just trying to get me to do work and wasn't going to pay me. What? So I went over there, worked for him for about a, like two months. And I, I went from doing a, going being a startup guy to two weeks later, I was doing his plumbing and his electrical for him. 
on his brand new pools because nobody in town would work for him anymore. And so <laughs> me and oh, this wow. old guy named Dale Geary uh, was going around and he taught me how to plumb and he taught me how to do electrical on my own. So we were out there doing that stuff, uh, doing all the plumbing electrical on pools. And then September 11th happened. And I remember we came into work and I'm sitting there and everybody kind of moves into the break room and we're watching the stuff on the TV. And when that happened and the economy stopped spinning, he lost it all. He, he was using pools to pay for pools that hadn't been started yet. You know, money from pools to pay for the old ones. Um, and it just went all of a sudden this guy was gone and then this employee was gone. And he kept me last because I was the lowest paid employee. Sure. And uh, he let me go. And I went to James at Presidential Pools. I remember Bill Watson offered me a job. I asked him for an interview. He told me to come down and interview. Said he wasn't really hiring. So I and I didn't know shit, man. I'll be <laughs> frank. I didn't. I go into his office. He goes, so "What do you know about pools?" I said, "Everything, <laughs> everything." So like, you know how to work on pumps? Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah, I, I, I could do it. I needed a job. All right. And I just yeah, I know it all. Trust me, man. I'll, I'll be your best employee you have. He's like, yeah. Oh, I'll let you know. We're not really hiring right now, but we'll get back to you. And I was crushed. You know, I was. I think he knew I was full of shit. He's a smart. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a smart dude. Yeah, James. we've had people come in just like that, where yeah. we're like, "Yeah, man, you don't even know what that's called." No, you're or twenty three, yeah. you <laughs> yeah. know everything. Right? Right. <laughs> so anyhow, he um, and you don't have a job. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. so he calls me on my way home. I'm driving home. Well, I'm getting a ride home at the time, and he he calls me and he says, "Hey, I can hire you part time. All right, you're gonna come in here. You're gonna help clean up the office a little bit because they were building their, their new facility." You can come clean up, maybe learn a little bit about service. And I was just thankful. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm on it. You know, I, I go down there and I start working in service and they blew up so quick that not even within one week, they had to put me in a truck to start doing service. It's like, well, you, you said you know all this stuff, right? You're good to go. <laughs> and I'm shitting bricks. I thought I was going to get training. <laughs> all right. You know, I thought I was going to get some training to, to be able to go out there and do these things. And it didn't happen that way. They put me in a truck. My first job is to go out and change seals on a pump. <laughs> oh man! For, I don't know in a repair truck. Is. I don't even know what a seal is, man. Yeah, the that, YouTube those... video is not hot yet. No, <laughs> no, we no, we had mystery machines back there. We were we were in the vans back in the day. Right. You know the uh, for just after the dog catcher era yep. went away and they turned into you know the service guys having the vans. That's yep. what I was driving was a little Astro van, nice Scooby Doo van. Oh yeah, <laughs> no windows. You know, it's the scary van. <laughs> so anyhow, I go out to that job and this is before we had picture phones. Because I could at least take pictures of how I broke it down. Right. But I didn't. So I broke it down, and I just stared at it for about an hour. <laughs> and I realized I have no clue how to put this thing back together. No clue at all. Did and you get the impeller off? I, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what that was. I pulled the bolts out. So that's a no? Out. You pulled no, the four bolts off? <laughs> I had... I had ten start or ten stops that day. What? And I didn't even complete the one. <laughs> so I don't tell anybody I didn't make any of those stops. I go back to SEP. It's like two in the afternoon, and I grab a parts book. I grab the Hayward's part book because they used Hayward at the time. I grabbed the Hayward part book, went back home, studied that thing and how it went together, and I went back to the job site. It took me about an hour and a half, and I slapped that motor back together, turned it on. And I had the seals in backwards. <laughs> so it started leaking right away. Yeah. So I pulled back apart. I saw the seals were back. Put it back together. Anyhow, long story short, it all works out. Pump fires up. There's no leaks. And I can't even tell you the feeling that came across me <laughs> when I put sure. that thing together. And that thing fired up. And the customer came out and had a smile on their face. And that pool was running. I was like, this is it. That was the hook that got me stuck in this business was when I fixed that one pump. And then within about a year and a half, I turned into their number one service tech doing 12 to 15 calls a day. Uh-huh. Um, everybody else is doing six to eight calls, and I'm knocking out 12 to 15 calls a day. And that's where I met my wife. She was the one that was overloading me with work. <laughs> <laughs> she knew I could handle it. I think she wanted to see what I was made of before she right? yeah. made an attempt. You for know what sure. I mean? Um, so anyhow, yeah, I did that. I did that for about a year and a half, and then I begged them to move me up into construction because my buddy Bill Watson, who did that, he moved into construction, was a superintendent, so they did that. I did building for about two and a half years, and then uh, I got the owner. We were in Vegas or a Christmas party. I can't remember exactly what it was, and I got some alcohol on him and convinced him that I was going to be a good sales guy. And James had already said, there's no way in hell 
you're ever going to be a sales guy because I'm not going to lose a superintendent like you in the field. Sure. So I go to the owner, get in his ear, and he's like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you can be a sales guy. We'll, we'll do it. Beginning of the year. And so I go back to James, and Tim said I could be a sales guy, and they, he was livid. I'm oh, sure. <laughs> he was livid. So the only way that I was able to do it, I had to bring someone in, train them, and then I had to build all my own pools that I sold. So I was the only sales guy for the first year I was doing sales. I had to build all my own pools that I was selling too. Oh, wow. That was awesome. Pretty good training there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what happened with those other nine stops? They got done the next day. And then the, I was able to move a couple onto a couple as we went. Yeah. And yeah, it, nobody ever knew. Nobody ever knew? Nobody ever knew. <laughs> Oh, nice. You know, that is a pretty rare thing for anybody to do um, when going back to taking that part of pump. I mean, you going to SEP, getting the manual, <laughs> running back. I mean, even the part where you put it, the seals in backwards and it leaked and you had to do it all over again. Like most people would not do that. Yeah. What made you kind of just go that? Is it because you told them that you knew what you were doing and you had to show yeah, them? I needed a job. Yeah. If I just told James I knew what I'm doing and I go out there and I have six pump seals on my list of things to change for the day and I couldn't even do the first one, I was done and I and I, and I was scared for my life. You know, I was scared. What am I going to do? Right. What am I going to do? And so I just made it all happen and there was no choice. There was no other way. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't an alternative. It was get that motor back together and get that thing running and move on to the next job. What, what uh, time of year was it? Summer. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> Course. No, no, it was uh, it was it was actually October because that was out right okay. after the September 11th. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he hired me October 15th. So it wasn't too hot. But. Well, I don't know. October summers here. Or, or October's yeah. here is like summer everywhere else. Yeah, that's yeah, the same Boston. Yeah. yeah, that's still monsoon season. Yeah, it's still sweaty. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so you did that, and then what? So that's how you learn how to build pools, obviously, right through yes. through them. Yes. Nice. The, and at that time, the guy who taught me the most was for sure Tim Murphy, the owner of Presidential Pools. The guy, for some reason, not a lot of guys, or I just going to say, a lot, a lot of builders like Tim Murphy because of how, and I think it's because of how successful he is and sure. the ship he runs. I give that guy nothing but credit. That guy worked his ass off to get to where he was. The guy put in the time. The guy knows a ton about swimming pools. I think I know more now. <laughs> but he knows a ton. And that guy is an animal. That guy worked his ass off. And I saw it firsthand sure. what he did and what he went through to grow a company from nothing to the biggest company in, in, in the town right now. Right. So to see him do that kind of stuff, that just, I don't know, it, it really drove me to want to move into construction. And when I did, I got to start doing pre-site meetings. Any project that was over a certain size or had a sunken bar or something on it, he made sure that he was on the job site. That before Doug, after layout, meeting with the client, the salesperson, the construction manager, and the superintendent. And when he would talk, I just shut up. I think that's the biggest thing is when I heard him talk, I knew he knew what he was talking about. So I just shut up and listened. And what I learned from him was he wasn't just talking about what's in front of him. He was thinking about every single person coming after that next person. He wasn't thinking about the excavator. He already had that in his mind. He knew what that pool was supposed to look at. He was thinking about, where is the plumbing going to run? Is it going to be in the ray of this column? Is it going to be, is there going to be a tree here? Is it going to be this? Is there going to be that? And for me, that was eye-opening. You know, just to know that there's so many other pieces to the puzzle while you're sitting here focusing on the first corner you're trying to put together. You know, and that I think that's what really helped me understand and, and a, a good way to build pools is to think about every single person that's going to come after that and what you have to do to make sure their life's easy. Yeah. I come to think of, it, I've never really, I don't think any of the presidential pools we've serviced have been like a pain in the butt to yeah. work on. They've all had enough room, you know, between pumps and the walls and the filters are far enough off to well, yeah. take them apart and they're, they're done very and well. Their, their new facility is unreal. If, um, aren't they out of Gilbert as well? Yeah. I clean those floors a few times. Oh, yeah? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. they have all the different pools that um, the homeowners can come yeah. out and take a look at. Um, I, did, I designed two of those pools. Oh, really? Yeah. That's oh, awesome. Nice. Nice. Yeah, the first three in the middle were there when they first started, and then they had a contest for designing the the end pool and the, and the other pool, and, and I designed both of those pools. And Tim always changed. He went out there with a spray paint can and changed them up, but um, he changed them up a little bit. But, yeah, that, guy, that guy's got a great operation, a great facility, and he, he is – 
no matter what anybody says, that guy is great for the industry, for the market that he's in. And yeah, he yeah, I mean, he knows to stay out of the custom high end stuff. He knows. He sees something come across his desk and he says, no, that's not our wheelhouse. This is what we do. Can he build it himself? Absolutely. He can build anything, I'm sure. But he knows for what his company's doing that they need to stay in a certain a certain area. Well, he knows how to protect his employees. He knows how to protect the name. Yeah. You know, that's what we try to do, too. We try not to take on stuff that we don't can't handle you know and a lot of people don't do that don't look at it that way they see money and just like you did saying that you can that yeah i'm I'm number one i can do everything that's kind of you know sometimes the mentality of when they try to build pools and then you'll see it (laughs) that work is shoddy and absolutely (laughs) you know that's i I don't know who his mentor is or who taught him what he how to hire people that guy knows how to find the right people and put them in the right places absolutely that's what his biggest success was the people that he finds they stay they stick with him you know and and he's had these people in these positions and they they make him shine he's very good at hiring people and putting them in the right spots that's important yeah i'm terrible at that (laughs) (laughs) i think i hire everybody and they automatically absorb everything i have through osmosis you know and walk away from them well that's been a big part of our since we read traction right so there's a book called Traction that that's a lot about yeah. what it is. Have you read that one? No, I haven't, but I saw that uh, that was one of the books recommended by Michael, right? Uh, no, that's we we recommended it um, a while back. I think when we first started the Pool Chasers Instagram and Facebook, we had recommended it, and I think we had talked about it quite a bit just because it impacted. I think us I think brothers somebody sometimes. commented though and said Traction. Right? Oh yeah, somebody so maybe did that's say where, maybe that's how you saw Traction. But we that was a big influence on how we do things. We've yeah. we started moving people into different places after we read that, and you know there was one one or two people that were like, yeah, they, they're not they can't be on this team, and you know it was it's cool. Yeah, Buzz Giz turned me on to Jeffrey Gittimer. You ever heard mm-hmm. of that guy? Love that guy. He had him uh, come speak at an event one time. Loved him. And he, uh, his little book of leadership and the other books he has, was if you implement it correctly, it's stellar for your company. I implemented it as just be nice to all your employees and give them everything without them doing anything rather than <laughs> reward them when they do something. And, you know, so I, I didn't, at first I didn't implement it correctly, but now I've learned my mistakes and... And I'm doing sure. the current employees that I have. Yeah. Sure. It takes a lot of work paying such close uh, close attention to everything because you have your normal day-to-day that you have to do and then paying close attention to what they're doing and their training and yeah. making sure that, um, you know, everybody's on the same page. Yep. Since we're talking about books, is there two books that you would really recommend to everybody reading? I recommend them. Um, <laughs> okay. I should say, <laughs> let me correct that, <laughs> that you should listen to through Audible. Well, be, yeah, that's it. I'm not going to say I read. Um, I read what I have to read. You know, I just, with the three kids and, again, shutting everything off, I don't have time. I wish I could sit and open a book. I do on airplanes right. Right, when I fly across the country and do different different things and consults, but um, Audible is, is what where it's at for me. I could sit there and drive on these long drives between jobs. When I'm working at 3 o'clock in the morning, I have that plane in the background. Um, but that's the biggest thing for me is, is Audible. But I use... Uh, my, to this for the ones that my wife what we do at home is i recommend a book my wife recommends a book and we have to listen to it and i like that because i'm listening to stuff that i probably never would ever listen to and she's recommended some of the best ones to me so far that i thought i wouldn't even care about but they were phenomenal but for me the one that i recommended that came out killer because i listened to the guy on joe rogan was jordan peterson and his 12 principles of life uh, 12 rules for life crushed it i mean that guy maybe it's because he's canadian and he doesn't have the american influence of being, you know, <laughs> being a wussy that's probably you know? that's probably possible <laughs> and, and, and helicopter parents and stuff but man jordan peterson's book is phenomenal if you want to learn how to treat people if you want to learn how to be a man and stand up for what you're doing woman whatever it is own up to it this is why you're this way don't blame it on anybody else just take it and, and those 12 rules yeah, they, they definitely changed my life. And I go back and listen to those things all the time. And it changes the way I talk to people, treat people, and, and even my family at home, the way that, that I approach them is completely different, too. Nice. And then my second book, any, any Jeffrey Gittimer book is a good book just because they're short reads. They're mm. quick, motivational. You can get through them. I don't think that people communicate enough at home. No. You know, I think there's a huge gap when people work and they come home and the tv's on I, like we don't have tv at our house we have netflix 
so we Netflix and chill. You know, that's it. And there usually I'm falling asleep 10 minutes into it. But <laughs> yeah. um, unless you're talking about architecture. All right. But, um, <laughs> or Ozarks. Damn, that was a good show. You guys watch Ozarks? No. I keep seeing it on Netflix, but yeah, I haven't checked I it out. I kept seeing yet. it pop yeah, up. But... You'll go down a deep hole. <laughs> um, no, uh, how to fix your marriage without actually talking about it. Um, without talking about it. It's a book. And that was phenomenal for me to understand how to communicate to my wife better. I tell her everything is is right now. Uh, and we talk about everything. There's nothing that's off the table, but just to understand where her mind's at, um, how she takes something that I say, how to say stuff. So she takes it a certain way, how to communicate, how to convey things with the children. Uh, that for me was, was huge. And for her too, she understands why she makes a certain comment to me. And I go, what? Right. What are you talking about? Or when I say something <laughs> to her and her eyebrows look at me crazy and I'm thinking that I'm just being nice, but I'm realizing the way that I relay it or the way that I communicate it is not good for, uh, you know, positive communication throughout the rest of the conversation or whatever we're talking about. You're already putting somebody on edge because you're not relaying your message correctly or how they need to hear it. Yeah, their defense comes up immediately. They yeah. don't really hear what you're yeah. saying yeah. Anyway, after yeah. that. <laughs> so, I think that has a lot to do with it, the way that you say things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I have a great and a, and I have a, a great marriage. You know, I'm not trying to justify anything, but my wife and I communicate about everything, and, and we have a great marriage. There's nothing that, that we can't get through together, and I know that. And so this book wasn't to fix anything more or less just to understand to make it better just to make it better sure. you can never you can never i mean you can never work hard enough to keep on making it better and better and better right never there's never you can never stop working on it yeah any good relationship in your life is always good to mm -hmm. keep thinking about how to make it better and your friendships and your marriage and yeah. you can never do enough to you know keep those absolutely strong when you don't communicate and you separate it the longer, and one of the, it says it in this book, and the longer that you stop communicating and you keep that separation from just interaction because you're aggravated or whatever, that aggravation grows for no reason or that separation gets bigger and bigger for no reason. So she says something in the book that you got what in order to try to get back to each other, just whether you want to or not, they have six second hugs. And you got to do six of them a day. We can't get six. We're not. We're not <laughs> if we did six-second hugs six times a day, basically get home and just hold on to each other. Until, and right. And kids, kids. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you right now, no matter what stress she's feeling, I can feel in her body when I give her a hug, she feels it with me. And when you give a quick hug, you just give a quick hug, pat on the back, you move on. But when you do that embrace for six minutes and you really, or six seconds and you actually hold on to each other, you can feel a release in each other. Yeah. Where you just calm, your shoulders relax and everything's right with the world you know and so we do that at least once or twice a day that's and awesome and that's, that's huge that's pretty yeah. cool it's like a moment of silence that's type deal you know take a minute to really like take time and feel it and uh, that's that's really cool I look forward to reading that book I think there's yeah. some listen to real it good takeaways yeah. from that <laughs> listen to it I don't read anything yeah, you, know what, you know what I like? we're on the same page yeah. man we don't none you of us I, read <laughs> I think what I like the most about re uh, listening to these books and listening to the authors is you get it from their perspective. You right. get it from their emotion while they're reading it, so you really understand it better, I feel. But that's my excuse for not reading some of the audio, those, Some of the audio books, they kind of go off the track, too. You'll hear them like, oh, man, I should have wrote this in part in this book, and yep. that's kind of cool because you get like a behind-the-scenes look at their audio. Yep. Yeah, if they're actually reading it, yeah. I know there's some, some, some really good, um, I guess, speakers or whatever they call them that actually – like Shoe Dog, have you read that one's the mm -hmm. Nike memoir? No, uh, Phil Knight. Um, I've listened to that probably ten times. Yeah, I don't know what it is about it, but I'm just like obsessed with it. Send them all over to me, man. Oh, dude, you'll. I think you'll like it a lot. It's it's really cool. Um, but just it's not Phil Knight speaking. It's this other guy. But I'm like, dude, I don't. He could be talking about anything, and I would just you know soak it up. Yeah, I love for it. Certain guys you could just listen to talk all day long. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of knowledge and for girls, sure. And girls. And yeah. ladies. Sorry. And ladies. Definitely. <laughs> and ladies. <laughs> so what would you say is the biggest struggle when, you know, joining the pool industry? Uh, for myself, I, I have to say branding yourself. Uh, there's, I don't know, what, thousand of us out here uh, building swimming pools. I, I don't know. There's so many. Every, every day I'm driving down the freeway, I feel like there's another builder sign of another pool builder. Do we know, see them all the time? And it's insane. Another landscaper that thinks they can do it too. <laughs> um, 
And more, more power to you. They can't. Hopefully you can. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you, read, you read my mind. So thanks for saying it, Ty. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's branding yourself, separating yourself from the rest. Um, if you're not a big guy, if you're not a presidential Shasta, California, you're, you're really a nobody. You know, that's who these people are calling. That's who they're going to. That's who you're competing with all day long. And so when I first got into it, it was trying to figure out a name for my company, trying to brand myself differently so I didn't have to compete with those people and separate myself as someone who offers something different. And I, I think at an early stage, I, I, I knew I needed to do it that way because when I was selling pools at Presidential, my design abilities quickly escalated. Um, I started using Pool Studio years before anybody else was there. I was one of the first comp- one of the first guys in the company using it. I think it was their second year that they, the program was out, and everybody else was still doing hand drawings. Um, and so doing that, being able to see something from 2D to 3D and seeing how your design actually works in 3D made me understand how to design better, uh, and it, it grew my potential for design. So I started designing crazy stuff, and they would come into my office. I remember the CAD guys would come in, like, what the hell are you selling? <laughs> you know, what are you, because I didn't have to go ask anybody how to sell the project. I knew how to sell the project, and I knew how to design it. And so that got old real quick with all the owners and everybody else because they don't have the manpower to build custom. They can build a, they can build a custom, their idea of a custom pool is a larger kidney bean, sure. a larger rectangle. Something with a bunch of water features. That's not a custom pool. My idea of a custom pool is something you've never seen before. That's custom. You know, when you're designing something that's never been done before, that's custom. Just making the same thing bigger and throwing a bunch of shit on it doesn't make it custom. Right. And so that for me uh, was the turning point because when the economy started to go downhill, I was 100% commission. Um, and when the economy was downhill, I was playing solitaire and war games on my computer all day, not selling a pool. And I remember my, I, my wife came and I wrote about an article about this and my wife came to the office and I'm sitting there playing this video game. It's like a battlefield is what it's called. <laughs> and I was playing this game and she walks in and she goes, what the hell are you doing? So I'm just waiting for someone to come in the door. She goes, when's the last time someone came in the door? Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I haven't had a sale. I was selling 20 to 30 pools a month and I sold two or three you know it was bet terrible and so she you know just just joking around with me sitting there and then we leave and go home and she says jeremy you need to you need to stop this this isn't you you know she saw i was just not happy i wasn't happy at all i'm happy when i'm selling i'm talking to people not selling i hate the word selling uh educating and I, that's what i became a phenomenal i became their number one salesperson my second year there as a, as a superintendent, I moved up and I, I started smashing everybody and sold $5 million in pools in one year. Oh, wow. Sold two months. I had 33 sales. You know, I'm a service guy where these are service and superintendent who came in here and became the number one salesperson because I never drew the same pool twice. Because customers come in the door and I'd educate them instead of sell them. And I was always there for them with phone calls. And my wife knew that. So when I came home that night, she said, Jeremy, you just need to do your own thing. And I had never in my life ever thought of being a business owner. I had never, ever thought about anything beyond working for somebody. And when she said that, you know, I kind of thought about it. I said, yeah, you know, I'd rather sit on my ass at home and not make money than sit there and not make money. Sure. And uh, just kind of spawned off from there. And that's when her and I came up with the name of the company. And that's why Premier Paradise is Premier Paradise is because I didn't want to be just another pool builder. I wanted to be able to design the whole outdoor environment. And I knew that before I knew what a complete outdoor environment really was. That there was something more than just pools back here. Right. Yeah, and I think you bring. Yeah, and I think you branded the company very well. I think it um it really stands out. There's not a lot of other companies. Um, you know, just everything and I look at things the same way, everything from the typography, um, more minimal logo. Um, there's so many things that, you know, come into play with that, even the photos that you take and we'll get into this later, but, um, all that ties into the culture, the social media, how you kind of coordinate your SEO. There's so many things behind it. It's not just the logo and yeah. you know how your uniforms look. There's so much more to it. Um, and that is, you know, that's a big piece of the puzzle. I don't know if a lot of people focus on that as much. Um, I know so many that just kind of 
look at what somebody successful is doing, you know, somebody that's a little bit bigger and then they just try and copy it, copy it. And, you know, I think that's a recipe for disaster because, you know, they've been around, their logo looks like that because they've been around since the fifties or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but you know, you talk about this as well as making things timeless as far as the pools. And I think there's something to be said about, you know, your branding and the way the aesthetics of the pool and the backyards and all these different things, um, making something timeless, even as your logo yeah. is extremely important. So it can just, you know, last the times. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I even changed it. This is the second logo. I like this one. It's not changing. Yeah. yeah. I dig it. <laughs> Simple. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. How many it's people awesome. I get? They go, where'd you get that shirt at? I made it. Tommy Bahama. Yeah, you can't buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my mom didn't make it. I bought it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she sewed the little palm tree on there. <laughs> What is Premier Paradise? What's the, what, what do you think separates you from you know every other company out there? That's a good question. Um, I th- I'd have to say what I hear. I, I guess the best way to put it is the feedback I get from the people that come and approach me for design. They approach me. They want to build a pool. Is what they say is, you know, I've met with four or five different companies. I'm getting the same thing over and over again. They're not listening to what I'm saying. I asked for this and I'm getting that. But when I go on your Facebook page and your Instagram and your websites, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a pool like this. I don't see anything that's the same. I don't see anything that's... I see a whole complete design of a backyard. It's not just, here's a pool. You know, here's a pool. And again, going back to Structured Studios and that 3D program... That's when I started realizing how much landscape sold my project, how much the structure sold my project, how much the visual over effects. The top, yeah, the over the top visual stuff sells the pool I was trying to sell. Uh, and I think that's what really made me understand that we have more to do in a backyard than just draw a pool and get the hell out of there. Draw a pool, dig a hole, throw water in it, see you later on to the next one. That, that didn't interest me. I, I liked seeing the complete projects come together, walking away from something and knowing that that thing is done, that thing is complete. It is a design that was implemented from the word go. You know, I knew what I, as soon as I walked out of that customer's backyard, I knew what they were going to get. It didn't just start happening when I grabbed out my templates and started drawing around. I'm sitting there talking, I'm walking through their house and I'm looking at the artwork and I'm looking at the couches and I'm looking at the TVs and I'm seeing what the kids are the kids focusing on TV or the kids playing with toys and what toys are they playing with and and how does the mom talk to the kids and 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 you know how does the dad how do they communicate together I became a psychiatrist I feel like a psychologist I, I mean I just started analyzing everything and when I started doing that my design started to become very personal to the people and I, I, I would see people or I have uh, meetings with people, do their designs, and they'd come and see me and they say, how in the hell did you come up with this, what was in my head, without me having to say anything to you? And that's, you know, that's really when I knew that we were on the right path and doing the right thing. Sure. Uh, and we created that, like you want, you know, you created that culture of we are here working for these clients. We're not working for a boss trying to hustle pools. Right. You know, the clients are my are my boss. And then later on down the road, once I started getting better design and learning more, I kind of changed and I started being a little bit more choosy with my clients. Because the amount of effort that I put in, the amount of thought that I put into someone's design, I, I build pools for people that have zero appreciation sometimes for what I do and how hard I work. And they don't realize I'm dreaming about their pool and what's going to come the next day when I go there to design it and draw it. And I, I really started to value my time a lot more. So there's plenty of people that I'll talk to on the phone or ask certain questions. And if I don't get a good feeling and they don't, and they're just looking, oh, I saw what you did. How much was that? 80000 What? That's so expensive. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, why'd you call me? <laughs> right. There's a well, lot that goes into it. Well, we called you because I went to here, here, and here. They didn't listen to me. It's not what I wanted. This design doesn't look like how I like it. Their price is not any good, but you're way more expensive than them. Well, no shit, because I'm listening to you. I'm designing what you need to have in your backyard. I care about what I'm doing, and I'm not just trying to sell you something. I'm trying to build you a design. Like you said, it's going to be timeless. You're going to have this design, hopefully, for 10 years. 
and you're going to walk back there, and every time your friends come back here, their jaws are going to drop. They're not going to say, oh, my friend has that tile. Oh, I saw that same, yeah, I had that same pool with that same little plus six, plus 12, back down to plus six, and a little sheer descent, and <laughs> I'm not interested in that right. business. That's not, that's not, that doesn't make, that doesn't fulfill me at the end of the day to know that sure. I drew what someone else did or built what someone else can. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the culture I'm trying to create is that we do stuff based on what needs to be done in a backyard based on the client, what they, what they want, need, and what their lifestyle is. Yeah, you're trying to give them everything they just complained about not having. Yeah, right? and then when you tell them how much it costs, <laughs> how much do yeah. you charge for designs? Oh, 1500 bucks. What? Right. Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, you just had five other people do it. How much of your time have you wasted? Because I'll tell you, I value my time at 200 bucks an hour. Sure. The way I run my company. So if I spend six or seven hours of my time trying to do something and it doesn't pay off, I just threw that money in the garbage. Yep. You should value your time the same exact way, client. You should know that if you just had to spend two hours in five different showrooms, waste your weekends with your kids, not going to spend time with your kids because you're dealing with some sales guy that has no clue what he's doing, that time is just as valuable to you. It should be just as valuable to you as it is to me. So yeah, 1500 bucks is a drop in the bucket when you know I'm going to knock it out of the park. And if I don't, I'll put another crack at it until we get it right. Right. You know, so for me, that's that's huge. It's just, I don't know, knowing what you're worth. I think it's interesting you talk about walking through the house and picking up on those things because I think Greg and I had a conversation probably, I don't know, six, six seven months ago about the same type of thing and and choosing our clients the same way. It's, I mean, obviously we're in the service side of it, but you know, Greg, we talk about, we, we walk through their house and we see things because we want conversation pieces, right? You want to be able to connect with those clients, connect with those people you're talking with, because sometimes to be honest, you know, they're boring or they don't, they have no personality and it's like, Oh man, I don't even, you're not even understanding what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Like this isn't important to you, but like those pieces, you know, as you, Greg always talks about, like that's, that helps you get through the conversation, helps you get through the bid, helps you get through, yeah. And, you know, it's pretty cool to get to a point where you're walking through and understanding those people yeah. and it's easy. And then they relate to you. They drop that guard, you know, cause you notice something in some sports team they like or something you, and you mention it and yeah. definitely brings them down to another level where you can actually communicate. And then, like you said, you're not the salesperson anymore. Yeah. You're just somebody like, you know, get that they can communicate with and well, get along with. Don't you feel like when you educate them instead of sell them? that it, the whole entire meeting goes so much better. Very oh, much so. 100%. 100%. They, try to be, they try to have been sold and told what's wrong with everything the whole entire time rather than told them how you can assess the problem, how you can be there and, and educate them on the system so they understand what you're talking about in, in the service side. But in the construction side, we do the same thing. Just educate. Mm -hmm. And when I can go out there and educate, and they've been dealing with salespeople, it's, you know, for them, like a light bulb goes on. And it's like, oh, this, is, slam what dunk this, for this you. is what this is supposed to be like. Yeah. You know what? Even if they don't understand, they really value that you took the time to to teach them these things. You know what I mean? Because not a lot of people do that. And if you were like, you know what? Why don't you come over here? Because I want you to understand like that, you know, the cleaner in the pool is not the filter. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's always the filter is this. I call everything the filter. Call everything the filter. <laughs> um, but to Does really... the salt cell do it all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah everything. Right. <laughs> Detaches itself and goes into the pool yeah, and cleans know. it. And yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it, I think they... Um, they really like that, you know, somebody that will bring them to the equipment and explain to them that, you know, when there's um, a leak here and air is getting in, you know, the pump's not going to prime or, you know, when your, you know, filter PSI is really high that you need a backwash or, you know, there's all these different things that we get to show them. And I think they really respect a company that'll do that. And back to walking through the house, I think if anybody invites you into their home and a walk through it to get to the backyard, I think that is... I think you almost pretty much have it at that point because I remember in the beginning that wasn't a thing. No. And now it's like, it's just common for them to ask us like, Hey, let's go inside. You want something to drink? Yada, yada, yada. It didn't used to be like that mm -hmm. in the beginning, but you know, through social media, um, things like Yelp and other platforms and, um, you know, just word of mouth. I think that, you know, we've earned that trust and for them to, you know, let you through their home and do different things like that. I think, uh, that just puts you on a whole nother level. So you might as well follow through educate them and do what's in their pool's best interest. Oh, I agree. You know what I mean? And there's a reason why they reach out to you, Jeremy. It's not because they want some cookie cutter pool. You know what I mean? Cause you know what I mean? Hopefully they're paying attention enough to where, cause if I want on your website, me personally, the amount of money I have right now, I'd be off in two seconds. Yeah. 
I'd be like, nope, no, 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 no. Yeah, can't afford I'm in that. The wrong, I am in the wrong. Uh, I'm on the wrong website. All right. <laughs> I, I, I build. I'm building a pool right now. It's forty grand. I, I don't. I don't. I love building swimming pools. If you want to work with me, you just need to understand. I'm not the most expensive guy in town. I'm far from it. There's guys that charge more than me. You know, I'm. I know what my margins are. Um, I know what they need to be. The problem is, is I know what it truly takes to build that pool correctly where most companies are going to cut out half the steps because they don't care about what's under the tile they don't care about whether you waterproof this or that but i know as a small company warranties will shut you down in a second building something wrong and having to redo it will shut you down in a second when you're a big company and you build a thousand pools a year you can have failures you have failures all day try being a small company and building a million dollar swimming pool and you have a failure you're done yeah. I have processes that I have to follow to make sure that the pool's built right. My plumbing sizes, my hydraulics are key for every single thing. It's the lifeblood of the system. To where where my electrical runs to, how it's ran, how my glass tiles installed, how my standard tiles installed, everything. You know, and it's like I understand those processes and I bid my pools that way. And yeah, I'm more expensive because I take ten more steps to build your pool than the next person down the road's going to. Yeah, but you also get that quality, and that's, I think, goes back to you choosing your customers and making sure that you guys are both the right fit, yeah. which we do now as well. And I think that makes a big difference. You know, we we understand obviously that at some point you have to get the business and grow your business yeah. and build your name. But like at at some point, whether you build pools or service them, or you have to understand, like you said, your time what your time is worth. Yeah, you, know, you don't want to waste your time. I and mean, we've built this process now where even on the phone we tell them a bunch of stuff up front and if they don't like any of it like we're not going to waste either one of our time because yeah. i'm going to go out there and you're not going to like it and we're going to move on anyways you're not going to get that customer so you know you got to at some point doing your business you got to realize the value of your time and make that choice Absolutely. to where you're you know choosing those right clients i think i don't think a lot of people do that and no. i think that's that's a big reason why you have so many splash and dash companies you have so many builders and and remodelers that do things shoddy and it's just so like it's the wrong twisted mindset and i've 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 sold multiple jobs and even just this year i've sold a job i didn't make any money i, I sold a few jobs last year i paid to finish you know um it's just being brutally honest you know, i had a good relationship with the client they couldn't afford premier paradise so we try to cut things here and there out of the design and then when it comes to doing it i'm the guy that says my design needs to be built and I'll go and add these things and do these things and just for the integrity of the design because I, I just this is how I am I don't yeah. sacrifice anything I pull the money out of my own pocket do I do that anymore no but that's why I've learned to say this client loves the dream of it and they're super nice people and I don't want to see them get hosed by someone else but you know what it's not my problem right anymore it's not my problem you right. know what save up for another year if this is truly your end all pool and you want to spend 150 or 120 right now, save up. Right. I'll be here. Right. I'm done. You know, I'm I'm done. I'm done discounting. I'm done just trying to build pools anymore. It's you know, I, I need my clients to to understand that when I when I meet with them and most people are on board nowadays when I, when I go and and I meet with people they they get it. Yeah, because they're coming to you a lot of the time now. I'm sure yeah, they're drinking know. the Kool Aid. Exactly. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. want to take a little break um, to kind of go over a few things with you. First, I want to kind of go over an iTunes review that we received. You know, we've talked about you guys on Instagram about these, and we're so grateful for them. So we just want to share one, you know, I wanted to share a review from the pool man from Connecticut, PG Sequel. He says, I'm enjoying the episodes. It's nice to hear from people on the other side of the country that have the same ideas, struggles, and successes. Looking forward to many more episodes. I married into a family who has owned a pool business for over 30 years, and I have now been in the industry over 15 years myself. Best of luck, Tyler and Greg. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate that. You know, we totally agree with you, and it's crazy to hear the same stories, you know, on a complete different side of the country, and we're all going through some of the same stuff. So thank you again for taking the time out of your day to leave a review. We truly, truly, truly appreciate it. And if you guys could take time out of your day to go and help us grow this podcast and grow this community, we'd truly appreciate it. 
please go to iTunes, leave a review, and you know, you might get featured on the podcast as well. When we get back, Jeremy will kind of jump into the company culture and employees. And then we kind of get into his building process, which is a really cool part of the podcast. If you don't know much about building, you're definitely going to learn a lot here. And we also get into some of his favorite projects, you know, how they built a spa on the side of a cliff. And, you know, we get into the show Pool Kings and how they were on there and his experience there. So, you know, we hope you guys get to learn and listen just like we did. And we're going to get right back to it after a word from our sponsor. What's going on, everybody? This episode is brought to you by Jobber. Jobber is by far our favorite tool for collecting deposits, payments, scheduling customer jobs, and assigning tasks to a specific person on our team. If you're looking for a better way to stay organized, this is it. I don't even know how we did things before Jobber. If you have any questions, their customer service team is out of this world. Jobber is so cool that they are hooking up all of our listeners with a free 14-day trial. Just visit getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. That's getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. Try it out. We promise you won't be disappointed. Would you say that everybody on your team is, everybody's on the same page and, you know, the culture is good and, you know, processes are in place because we, we know how hard it is to find good talent and keep people around. And, yeah. um, it's just a constant struggle at every company, even the best companies in the world. It's, it's difficult. Um, how, how's that working out for you? Well, uh, yeah, I wasn't always the best at hiring people and bringing on employees and keeping them there. I, I always just thought people would just get it. When I hired them, this is what we do. Jump on board. You're another Jeremy Noggle. And we were just, we just, it's just not the case, you know. And, no. And like that just comes from years of just, you know, not understanding how, I guess, people's minds work, how people's mentalities are with the job. And uh, we kind of talked about this before it started. The podcast started about how people, I guess, as an owner of a business, I expect everybody to have that business owner mentality. And it's just not there. Most people just want to have job security, come in every single day, the lights are on, and I go home. And check in, check out. Check in, check out. And uh, But right now I have uh, Josh Irvin as my construction manager. My brother Steve's working with me. I have two CAD guys that do all of our plans for us. And they are definitely super valuable people. They, they are coming to me with stuff that I miss. They are communicating with my clients, uh, the constant communication with me, helping me understand how I might have designed something that, you know, should have been done a little differently or how it, it went from my plate to CAD's plate. And I didn't catch it off of CAD's plate before it went into construction. And But you don't get that from people that are checking in and checking out. Right. You know, so I, I, have, I definitely have a solid base around me that has really just started to form in this last year because I just... When people couldn't do it, I just did it all myself. And I still kept these people employed, but I just went out there and did it all myself and made it right and just had almost animosity towards some of my employees because I'm out here doing their job, but yet I'm giving you a paycheck. Right. Yeah, and that's so, a hard. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of cut that off too. <laughs> sure. You know, I cut that off too and uh, cut those people out. Luckily, two of them walked out on me, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um and I was able to bring on Steve and Josh has been there with me for the last four or five years. I went to high school with the guy, you know, he's a, he's a veteran. He's just, he's just an all around badass and he does whatever it takes at any time. The word no doesn't come out of the guy's mouth. I think I saw him on your website. He was on you play baseball. Kings. He was the one that was carrying that scupper over his shoulder. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, scupper's here. But yeah, he yep. played baseball and everything. Yeah. That's when we both saw ourselves on TV and said, Hey, it's time to hit the gym. <laughs> Dude, I was going to say you look good, man. I was like, hey, you lose, you know, 40, 50 pounds. I lost 45 pounds. Oh, did you really? Yeah. I was at, wow. I was at 225, two pushing 230, depending on what I ate that day. Now I'm at like 180. Wow. Nice. Man. Good for you. The, the constant struggle. Yeah, constant struggle. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. I love donuts, dude. I love them. Oh, dude, I'm the guy. I'm the donut guy that I have to pick up donuts every Monday morning <laughs> and uh, bagels. And I, oh. I do good. I don't, you know, I've never, I usually never 
have it ever. Um, but it's kind of a joke that like there might be every once in a while one bite out of a mm-hmm. random donut in there, and it's oh, me. Yeah. We all we all know yeah. who it is. No. Yeah, there's just one bite out of it. It's like, dude, and because I, I just I can't take it. And I'm just like one bite, dude. I gotta get out of here. Just get the donut yeah. holes, man. Yeah. <laughs> the donut holes, well, he doesn't really want to. He doesn't really want to eat it. He just wants to taste, and everybody knows. Like, oh, I'm gonna Greg touch that one. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the guy that buys a dozen for the crew <laughs> and eats four yeah. before it gets there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. I was raised in the off of Pepsi and Doritos, man. That's all I ate. That's all yep. was in the cabinets. So yep. <laughs> I told, changed my whole way of thinking when it came to eating. For yeah. sure. But. All right. So can you share with us a little bit, Jeremy, on your pool building process at Premier Paradise? Um, since you're the first builder we've had on the show, um, we'd really like to pick your brain on what the process looks like. I know there's still even quite a few people out there that don't even know what that process looks like. Sure. So maybe if you could just kind of... Uh, you know, let us know what your process looks like. Our, our process is a little more involved than a majority of the companies. Uh, we start the process by you know, obviously going to their house, uh, making sure that we have so- soils reports, um, which basically just tell you what kind of earth you're working with, what's underground, um, how you're going to build something if you don't know what's under there, where most people just build the same pool and the same kind of Soils same are using the same engineering. There's something out there called standards, which uh, is an engineer has a set of plans that are on file with the city, and it allows the pool builder to make the decision on what kind of soils they're looking at to know if that engineering will work for the project. So I don't know many pool builders that know anything about soils on their own or on their own. So what happens is most of these guys have superintendents and they just go out and start building pools. They don't care if the hole's dug, let's, let's move on. So soils reports are the most important thing because it tells you what's underground and what you're working with. And then you're able to provide the soils reports along with your engineering or along with your plan to the engineers so you can get the proper engineering for the pool. So we don't like to do standards on any of our swimming pools. We have custom engineering done for every single project. That way it's tailored to the client with the project that they're being built that's being built for them um if you build on standards and you have one issue with soils or anything like that then they will definitely the engineer if there's a failure will come out and he'll cut your pool in 500 pieces trying to find the issue so that he doesn't have to pay for your pool to be rebuilt so you hear a lot of people or or pool builders say we have a lifetime warranty in our structure they're full of shit the lifetime warranty is through the structural engineer uh, the structural engineer's insurance is the one that takes care of any failures that happens with the pool because he engineered how it should be built. It's the pool builder's responsibility to take that engineering and build it exactly per spec. So before he goes and destroys a pool to be rebuilt, he's going to investigate that thing, and he's going to find the smallest little thing, whether steel was too close to the earth, whether you're using sandy soils in a certain area, or if you have one type of soil on one side of the pool or another type of soil on the other side of the pool. He's going to get himself out of that thing, guaranteed. And you're going to be left holding the bill to tear out a pool and rebuild it if there's a, a catastrophic failure, like a crack or something. So most important thing is that you get that in place, you get your engineering, you submit your permits. After you've done all your construction plans, you have your in-floor cleaning system you know, designed by Paramount. There we go. Use Paramount. <laughs> That's a good plug. There you go, Buzz. So you get your system designed, you do all your hydraulics, you get your plans done, you submit your permits, you get your permits back, you lay out the pool. Uh, we always deliver toilets to all of our jobs. It's just something that I, when I was a superintendent at Presidential, I saw guys using the backyards on a regular basis. It is $100 a month to have a toilet on site. Pay for it. We really <laughs> appreciate you because there's a lot of times that we are cleaning <laughs> pools out there in the very beginning. Yeah. And we would see those on site. Yeah. And we would just, because it was that or, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't want to talk about the other yeah. option. But. No, you never go in the equipment <laughs> area. No, never, <laughs> never. Yeah. So anyhow, yeah, we, we, we do that. I might clients pay for it. I have no pro- I love showing my clients that they're paying for a toilet in their backyard because they that's one of the things I get back. Nobody else had that in there. I love that. I love to know that, you know, yeah, they're I'm taking be, care of my employees. Not. I want to give them a sure. nice place to work where they can stay and hang out and not to drive to Circle K. I mean, it might be a little selfish on my end, but that's in 30 to 45 minutes. They're not going to be working on my job site. Yep. So anyhow, you get that delivered, put your sign in the yard. It's free advertising. And then you go forward, you excavate that swimming pool, and you make sure you meet those excavators on site to go through everything. Check your excavation. You go move into plumbing, steel, 
a lot of our pools get two or three stages of plumbing and then steel, and then the plumbers come back out to put plumbing through spa walls or wherever it needs to go, steel phase two, plumbing phase three, whatever it might be, electrical. And then you get your inspections from the city or the county, and once you pass your inspections, you shotcrete the pool. So after our pools are shotcrete, uh, we don't go right back to work on them. We actually have a seven-day cure time minimum where our pools will water either with a sprinkler. We don't... Before I get into that, we don't make our customers water their pool. Yeah. My engineer has given me a set of plans to build a certain swimming pool with. I want to make sure that that concrete has the best opportunity to cure properly so I don't ever have to look at that warranty sure. or honoring that warranty ever again. So we water cure our pools for seven days, and we do it ourselves where most companies make the customer water it. I'm not going to rely on a customer to water my pool properly. Yeah. So we use anywhere from sprinklers. they won't. They will not. <laughs> so we use sprinklers. Uh, we use automatic sprinklers that go off every 30 minutes to an hour, depending if the sprinklers are, if the pool's too close to the house, then we'll use soaker hoses to soak the, sit on the side of the wall of the pool and it soaks down the pool and it runs 24 hours a day. Um, and then we also use, uh, for certain projects, we'll use burlap sacks or carpet, soak it down, soak the pool, soak the carpet and lay it over there and tarp a pool. Um, that's mainly for the pools that we use glass tile in uh, to, minim- to minimize any kind of surface cracks or anything like that. So then after that, you're going to usually come in with masonry, hardscapes, put your hardscapes up, and then we do all of our waterproofing. So our first layers of waterproofing will start going on, and then following that would be tile, stone, deck work, uh, building the structures, uh, the ramadas, the structures, and then coming in doing our next coat of waterproofing around all the fittings, the N4 cleaning system, uh, getting that installed, cleaning up the whole entire project, and then getting your final inspections and and moving on to putting the interior finish in. And then some projects will also get gas uh, for barbecues, fire pits, whatever whatever kind of fire features they might have on the on the property. Heaters. Nice. Heaters, yeah. yeah. And then shortly after you guys are installing all the equipment, or was that back when you were doing the, the equipment, electrical? You know, it really depends on the scope of the project. If it's a simple project that only has a few pumps and filters, we'll install the equipment right away. A lot of times what I like to do, I'm, I'm a huge stickler on clean equipment sets, and so uh, I actually care more about the equipment than I do the pool. <laughs> but um, what we'll do is we'll do what they call a rough plumb, where they stub everything up in front of where the equipment's going to sit, and I pour custom pads Instead of using the two by three little concrete pads uh-huh. that that break the hell, all the hell after about mm-hmm. a year or two, or crack, we uh, we'll pour four inch concrete pads with steel in them that have little housekeeping pads for the pumps to sit up on so they're level because we always do our pads with a slope on it so the water will drain off. So then we do a little four by eight by sixteen block that sits on that pad that is level so your pumps will sit level. Nice. And before we do that, we run our low voltage sleeves. Um, and we run our high voltage sleeves back to the back of the pad so we can have quick, the whips go right from there into the pumps. So you don't see any electrical lines anywhere running on walls. And then all of our low voltage for uh, thermostats, uh, temp sensors, I guess is a better word, temp sensors and uh, actuators, you know, automated valves mm-hmm. and uh, IntelliChem injection systems. We like to run everything through conduits so you don't have a bunch of hoses and wires running all over the place that could be yanked That's out really or, cool. or broken. So I, I love pouring uh, custom equipment pads. That's yeah. really cool. What I'm really surprised, I'm just kind of talking about this a little bit, is um, at any time have you ever built like a shelter for the equipment or anything like that? Yeah. Um, I always thought by this point that there would be more builders building the shelters for the equipment and things like that. Just We've done some. Uh, it depends on the scope of the project. You know, some people just don't care. And for me to try to sell a, a shade structure over that thing, I don't. I, Aluma Wood has a new setup that they do. You know, the guys that make those Aluma Wood pergolas, the lattice roof structures that have, that are made of that aluminum material that's painted, powder mm-hmm. coated. Mm-hmm. You see them. You'll see them now in every backyard if you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But everybody has them. The Spanish brown color. They actually came out with a system where they have a, a screen, a mesh awning system that that they're doing now for covering pool equipment sets. And I've used that a couple times, and it's, it's, it works great. But, uh, and that's the one that has like the little uh, latch on it, almost like a pool fence. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've been seeing a lot more of those. They're kind of a pain, obviously, yep. to clean the pool, but I think they're really awesome because yeah. it really kind of keeps the sun off of uh, oh, yeah. either the pool, the equipment, or whatever, and it's Definitely easy fix. Prolongs it. See, from a service aspect, like what you're talking about, it's a great question because you have a lot of panels and controllers that have 
uh, digital readouts on them. And if you don't think about sun exposure and where those panels are sitting, you end up having warranty issues with screens blacking out or blanking out and not working anymore or certain hoses not being able to handle the sun here. So you definitely have to think about those things and, and how you're locating them and not keeping them in 12 to 16 hour a day suns in the summer here and trying to minimize. Yeah, I think that would be difficult with, you know, because I know Pentair's got the new like touchscreen coming out. Hayward has had theirs. Um, you know, all the um, variable speed pumps have screens and I know they never have any coverings. And especially if you guys are doing chem feeders and yep. all those small hoses and everything, I'm sure it gets beat up real quick out here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Pentair loves warranty and stuff in Arizona. <laughs> they, I mean, that's, I don't think I warranty hardly anything with them except for when their injection systems first came out with those hoses and those things were getting beat up. But now they have these new ones that work great. But, How's it been working with Pentair? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Shout out to Tish Dibble. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's sure. a rock star. She's for been sure. a friend of mine since they worked at National, since she worked at National Pool Tile, Rep and Tile, but I don't think they're, I have a better rep in town. Um, sorry, Nick Giz. But Tish Dibble's just, she's a sweet lady, man. She takes care of me at every turn. Anything I need, she's there for me. And Pentair's support is absolutely insane. You know, they're the leaders of all technology, in my opinion, and most people are just following them. Yeah, yeah I think we appreciate their quality of everything. You know, they test it for five, six, seven, nine years. I think they tested the, the variable speeds before they really put them out. Um, you know, their automation's been, that touchscreen's been on the rise for years now. You know, we've heard of it and they still haven't released it until it's perfectly right. You know, they just take the time to build it, engineer it correctly. I, st I still have to engineer it. Yeah, no, you're right. They, they will take the time and they're not going to release anything just because someone else has it out. But I've been, I have pumps that are 10. 10 years old that no issues yep. still running like a dream yep and i mean it's yeah we have original IntelliFlows with you know the colored buttons and no actual screen it's just but you know we have still yes, have sir. those running oh yeah yep we still have some freaking whisper flows with band clamps <laughs> lids <laughs> that we're dealing with yesterday. <laughs> yeah. No, they're definitely in my in my eyes and you know whatever but in my eyes they're they're one of the one of the leaders of any kind of manufacturing when it comes to the pool business. Yeah. Yeah. And so going back to, you know, when you guys are building the pool and this and that, um, you know, you're paying close attention when you're discussing with a customer before even building the pool. Are you looking at, you know, uh, kind of access points as far as, you know, when they open the front door, if they can see the pool, once they open the screen door and they can see certain things, are you making sure that everything is lined up? You know, when the pool lights come on, they can see it from this angle. You know, there's so yeah. many um, variables in that that I think a lot of people might, you know, kind of see past. I might have to ask for a paycheck if I start disclosing all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, sure. and that's And that's more design. Okay. And I would say construction. Um, but you're, you know, you're it's all in my head. It. When I pull up to a job site, I take a picture of the, the street, the roads, uh, the driveways, the plants in the front yard. I take a picture of every single thing, the panel, what the panel power is, uh, gas meters, accesses. And that's the reason why I walk through someone's house. If a customer wants to meet me in the backyard, I just get in my truck and leave. If you don't want me to walk through your house, I don't want to do business with you. You know? <laughs> nice. Um, so, because for me, I need to see those sight lines. I need to see how I walk through the front door and what I see in your backyard when I, when I walk back there. I need to see what windows, where's your master? When you wake up and roll out of bed, what are you going to look at? I'm not going to put a barbecue right outside that window and you're staring at stainless steel components. Um, I'm not going to have a light just to sacrifice budget, which so many companies do because I remodel a lot of new pools. You'd be amazed. I remodel pools that are two or three years old. Um, just completely tear them out of the ground and start over. Um, where you flip on a light and it's shining in the family room. Yep. <laughs> you know, you, you have a skimmer that's sitting on the back of the pool and you're looking at a throat, uh, plastic lids in the deck, all this stuff. It's just, just take some time to think through the process of what would you want to see if it was your house? You want to take as much hodgepodge crap off of that pool so that when you look back, that your eyes aren't going all over the place and it's just seeing the environment and that you created back there and, and, and how it lays out. You don't want to look at a deck lid. You don't want to see a skimmer throw. You don't want to see a light shining in your eye. You have to think about all those little things and, and how it's going to attract customers' eyes away from the beauty you're trying to create. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's it's awesome. so important back to the money that's spent there, all the memories that are made by the pool. And, um, yeah, it's just extremely important to pay such close attention to all those all those little details. Yes, sir. Um, you know, talking, you know, touching on this a little bit, what would you say is your 
favorite project that you've had? I know you've done a lot of really cool pools. Yeah. <laughs> favorite project or favorite client? Mm. <laughs> hey, sometimes, you know, it's not always the most extra- extravagant pool. Yeah. Um, it's more just that experience. Maybe it was your very first pool that you ever built. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would have I'm to sure there's say, a story there. I, I have to say, you know, I built some a couple million dollar projects, um, and they're not my favorite. I mean, I, I had one that we did was over two million dollars. And the details that we pulled off and what we learned on that project is insane. I mean, absolutely insane. We pushed ourselves to the limits on it. But there's one in particular that we did. It was roughly $600,000. It was uh, started off with just wanting to put a spa out on the edge of a mountain. You know, uh, the guy called, well, actually, um, I won't say who referred me because then it sounded like she's biased. But she referred me to one of her friends who's a realtor. And I got a call to go up to the top of Sanctuary Resort to go see uh, a lot that this guy had purchased, a Canadian guy, a phenomenal client, and all-around favorite project, favorite client. Guy was just a phenomenal guy to work for. We spent 18 months building this project. Well, anyway, I go up there. He's had interior designers, exterior designers. He's had about five or six people come up with stuff. And I, I get a call to go up there, and uh, they had seen a couple of our projects. And he said, well, I want your opinion can I put a spa right there? And where he's saying, can I put a spa right there is on a rock cropping that's sitting 30, 30 feet out from the house. And, uh, it basically drops off 150 foot all around the whole entire thing. <laughs> and wow. Me being me said, hell yeah, I could put a spa out there on that mountain. <laughs> right. Um, I got a problem with saying, no, I can't do something. <laughs> a major problem. And, um, if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to educate myself and I'll figure out how to do it. So what's what we did. This is a, the spa itself cost about with the deck support system. We do is about 400 grand just for the spa and the deck. And uh, we ended up redoing the pool in the back. He had a pool in the backyard that was free form shape that was sliding down the hill. So we ended up cutting it all up and putting a pool inside of that pool and, 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 you know, fixing it to the mountain so that it wasn't going to move anymore. And when we got in, into tearing out their old deck sub, he had an old wood deck substructure that was there, that was falling apart. And when we go underneath it and look at it, you can see that the homeowner, or the builder, or somebody just kept putting shims in between <laughs> between the steel beams and the bottom of the deck to keep it from so it was level. Right. Yeah. So they had about like six, seven shims that, from it. Keep on. <laughs> so we had soils nice. engineers. I'm I'm climbing the mountain with soils engineers, looking at everything, and the guy. I said, you know, how, how far do I have to dig down? What do I got to do to get footers, this, that? And he goes, you're on a mountain, man. He goes, just scrape off the dust and you can put it right on these rocks because you're, you're at bedrock already. You're already at where you want to be. And that was an education in itself for me. You know, I knew a lot about, from going through the Genesis program I did, I knew a lot about soils and, and how to work with them, but I didn't realize it was going to be, just put it right here. You're ready to rock. Right. Um, so we go in there and we start tearing this whole deck apart and tearing it down and we look at the house and the house wasn't level. So the house was moving too. <laughs> so not only did we build this spa, the spa is basically hovering three feet above ground right now. Mm-hmm. And it's sitting, you can drive by, you can drive down Lincoln and see the spa sitting on the top of the mountain. Yep. But it's sitting three feet above grade on steel beams that are go out 20 foot. So this thing is just basically hanging out in midair and the whole thing is a perimeter overflow. So we had to figure out a way to encase all of our pipes and do everything on this project without being able to hide anything anywhere. And so everything's built inside of the structure. So in order to get up there and start working, we had a demo first and we had to tear out all the deck substructure, uh, get rid of all the existing deck, tear it all out. There was nothing for us. Once we did that, there was nothing for us to access the job site. So we had to hand carry everything into the site. Um, (laughs) Cranes couldn't crane anything because they couldn't get up the driveway. The driveway from the spa down to the ground was about 220 feet. And so the driveway was so narrow, they couldn't get a crane and get the outriggers to yep. go out so that they can crane anything. And the largest crane they have, their 10,000 ton crane, can only lift like 500 pounds by the time I got up to the hill, but by the time <laughs> it leaned over. Right. Wow. Or by the time it extended all the way out to where we were. Right. So we had to hand carry everything in buckets. Um, basically we would go down to the bottom of the street, drive up this driveway that was so steep that if you had too much material in the back of your truck, your tires would just spin. Yep. So we had crews that would just drive up to the top, 
They load into buckets. Those guys would go up 50, about 50 flights of stairs, and then they would tie themselves off and rock climb around the whole <laughs> entire house to get to the backyard. So we had to build a pool first and work our way out to the spa on the front. All the steel beams had to get sent out to the job site, get cut, get lifted up, hoisted by manpower only, and then welded back together on site. So everything took basically 10 times longer than it should. Right. And when you work in sanctuary, you get to work from basically between 9 and 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. And you can't use generators and you can't use power tools. So, yeah, it's... <laughs> so this thing was like handcrafted. Yeah. And get it done tomorrow. <clears throat> right. Get it done tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And so it That's... was just, it was a, it was a big time pain. But seeing what my crews and my contractors and my construction manager, Josh, just was relentless on just showing up and making sure things were getting done. I mean, that for myself, just to see what people were capable of, that I had no clue what we became. I mean, if I did that on a normal circumstance, on a perfectly flat yard, jam that out, no problem. But to see what people that I had behind me were willing to do to pull that off, I think that for me made that my, my all-time favorite project. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that's crazy. That's the one I picked because that's one of my favorites yeah. that you guys have done too because yeah. I've seen it driving on Lincoln, yeah. you know. Over the last couple of years, and I found out you guys did it. I, was I just, like, I was pretty excited to have you yeah. on and talk about that one. <laughs> I just got a post that sent to me from my SEO guy where uh, they rent because they rent the house out, okay. and uh, I just got a post from someone that had a wedding out there, and they're sitting on the wood platform that hovers over the pool taking wedding pictures. Nice. Oh, no way. I mean, for me to see something like that, it's just epic to know that someone Heck thought yeah. that that project was worth their wedding photo shoots. Like you guys shit me, man. That's that's unreal for me. That's just yeah. That's that that's was freaking awesome. Dude. Yeah, totally cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I remember that right pool that you built, I rolled up to, and there was people taking their family photos that didn't even live there. Oh, yeah. They were taking the family photos right. like by the water features and the pool and stuff. I was like, oh, Yeah, Kirk great. Bianchi actually designed that project. Um, we built it without – he basically just gave us the design, and uh, we built that thing. And that was uh, – I learned a lot from Kirk Bianchi on that project about detail and, and how things can be done differently and stuff. And that guy's a, that guy's a huge influence to me too. I don't work with him anymore. He works with someone else now, um, but he's a solid dude. He's just, his design ability is insane, and and uh, he he taught me there's more that meets the eye when you walk through a house and in the backyard. For sure, yeah, he's he's the man. Very yeah, cool. we used to take care of that one for a while, and I know it, it had some structural issues with the spa, right? So did you guys have to come <laughs> come warranty that? I or never have structural issues, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> right, let's, let me rephrase <laughs> it so I, I can let me rephrase it then. <laughs> What is it? What do you call it? Uh, there was a, uh, it was glass tile that was installed. Okay. And there was just a, and I'll tell you right now, it doesn't matter how good you are, or what you are, glass tile fails. You know, there's <clears throat> processes that go in place to put it in. I do glass tile in house now because of that project. Um, there's just not guys in town that have the time to take on a proper glass and tile install, uh, installation method. They want to jam it out as quick as possible and, and get on to the next project. But when you install glass tile, you got to make sure you have, your pool is cured. If you look at the guidelines for how to install glass tile, your pool has to be cured for 30 days, your concrete. How many people do that? No, people are slamming Nobody. tile on a pool as soon as it's shot created. Right. If there's a 30 day cure time, you have to waterproof the shot creed with a cementitious. You have to waterproof it with an elastic membrane. You have to use glass tile thin sets. You have to float and then you have to waterproof that again. Then you have to install the tile. Then you have to wait about a week for the, the grout to cure. Then you can come back and, or sorry, for the thin set to cure. Then you have to grout it. Then you got to wait 21 days to put water on it. <laughs> Damn. Nice. So All for the tile. You're talking. So you didn't and, do and that, that one. And that doesn't include then. the install somebody, time. Somebody had done that. No, yeah, you guys. we didn't do it. I'm not going to say who did it. No, Someone did it. And I'll tell you, they honor their warranty. They went out there and fixed it. But it's going to fail again. I guarantee it's going to fail again because they didn't wait the proper times to do it. And I blame the customer for this one because they don't want to wait the time. I don't care. Fill up my pool. It's just tile. Right. Okay. All right. We'll sign this little form here that says when your tile falls off the wall, I'm not responsible. Sure. If it makes you feel any better, they blamed us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so your, your guy was brushing and he knocked off the tile. I'm like, really? So, yeah. It's like a brand new pool. <laughs> if my guy brushed it and knocked off the tile, yeah, there's, there's a problem. There's a problem. <laughs> there's a problem. Well, hey, guy, what are you brushing with out there? And so what yeah. happens with the, because there was a perimeter overflow spot, if you want to understand what happened out mm -hmm. there. When you have a perimeter overflow spa, you have hot water, cold water. You have wet, dry coming down the face of that thing. And so your tile, especially with the tile that was selected on that job, uh, it, 
when tile isn't annealed properly, which means cooled down after being heated, it has a lot of uh, potential to fracture and move, and it's going to expand and contract anyhow. And so when it's expanding and contracting against itself, it will just basically just fall shale right off. It'll shatter, or it'll just come off in a chunk. Chunks, yeah. And I had one of the best tile installers in the United States, in my opinion, do a job for us, and they did the methods correctly. Everything was proper. Everything was fantastic because a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tile install. I mean, they followed to a T. It took them eight months to do the project. Six months down the road, half of the spa fell off on the what? face of it, and it all came off in one piece. Oh wow! It wasn't like a couple came off. It all right. came off in one piece. And who you think the, the failure was? A thin set company. Hmm. They were able to break it all apart point it back to the thin set company and it was and thin set company owned it paid for the tile paid for the thin set and took care of the time to get it put back on wow nice. and so it the failures can happen in all sorts of manners and that's what i try to explain to people all the time if you get into this high-end industry of building these swimming pools you better be ready for them you better not run from them you better be ready for them and you better know how to fix them right, right? and it's, it's just it's gonna happen it's not yeah when it's you know, it's not if it's going to happen, it's it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. And you better know how to take care of it. For yeah. sure. I think, it, I mean, people, most people respect that if you just own up to it and fix your mistakes. Some people don't, but yeah. <laughs> majority of people do. No, no. It's Real, just, actual human beings. Yeah, quit, quit brushing that tile so hard, bro. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I told them. I know. We Hulk. Our own strength. Calm down, Hulk. I was trying to knock the calcium off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jeremy, the word on the street is you're a pool king. Is that true? Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that was that was fun. You know, that was that was a cool show. It was a good experience. Uh, they they approached me. It's actually funny to me. I don't know if it's funny to anybody else, but they send out spam emails, kind of. And I thought I was getting spammed by the same person three times in a row. And they sent out something. Hey, are you interested in being on TV? Blah blah blah. Because anytime they ask that, you're paying. Right. You're paying to be on TV. For sure. Um, after the thirty minute speech about how great it's going to be, and like by the way, it's ten grand. Right. Um, <laughs> And I've had multiple of those. So I finally, on the third time, I got an email from him. I said, look, if you're just bullshitting me and you're sending me this, take me off your list. Get me out of here. I'm done. Just quit sending me these emails. And I got a call not even 30 seconds later. I'm so-and-so with, you know, uh, the media co- I can't say the media company's name, but I'm so-and-so with the media company. I just want to call and apologize. I'm super sorry. Can I Skype with you? Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> so I get on Skype. And I turn it on, and it's this redhead girl, man, and she was hilarious. She was awesome at her job. She's from New York. And she's busting my chops the whole time. And she's asking me these questions, and she's looking at me, and she's like, yeah, I could, we could use you on TV. And what it was was basically a, a company that HGTV hired to find me to get me to the company, the production company All right. that was going to produce it for HGTV. So they were just basically feelers. She was putting out feelers. Yeah. Like a like an interview or something for yeah. If you're going to be an actor or yeah. something, you walk in and do that. You don't just walk and talk to the producer. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's what that was. They got us on. Uh, they got us on Skype. They had us on Skype, and we ended up talking to them. You know, it was funny. My wife goes, "You don't smile enough, Jeremy. Just make sure you smile all the time on <laughs> Skype. Otherwise, you're not going to get it." So I'm sitting there with like an ear to ear grin, yeah. smiling the whole entire time, and uh, and anyhow, but just yeah, it just ended up working out where they said. Let me see some of your designs, and I showed them that one that was on the show, and that was at, my, at the time it was a, a great design. You know, it was a unique design, so they really loved that, and they got a chance to talk to the client. They said, "Yeah, we want to do this," and uh, I was I was all over it. You know, I wanted the exposure, I wanted people to to kind of see what we were about. I was definitely really wary about it being cheese, sure, because I'm already kind of a recluse. You know, I don't <laughs> like to put myself out there. Yeah, and so that they, you are. Yeah. And so, well, things change when I got on TV. I realized <laughs> that um, it doesn't matter what people think about you. Just enjoy yourself. Yeah. You know, and it, it that show actually completely changed my personality and make me realize just do what you do. Quit thinking what people think about you or quit worrying about what people think about you. And um, it's opened up my personality big time. And uh, I, I owe that show a lot just for that. Nice. But, um, yeah, so I agreed to do it. They came out and we filmed and we were done. And when we finished filming, we came to find out we were supposed to be the only one doing the show just for one show. It was just going like to be a pilot that oh. ran. And if somebody liked it, fantastic. Sure. Well, 
they didn't trust the HGTV didn't trust the production company that they were going to find the right person. So they actually did it with four different production companies and none of them knew about each other. What? Yes. <laughs> so that's what the first four shows were when they oh, came yep. out. They that's why they're four, so they different. Four in a yep. row. That's why they're completely different. And nobody and, knew. And nobody knew until pretty much right before it started. I, I'm sitting there and the guy who did, his name's Randy Jones. Uh, the guy can't get enough credit. He's the director. Uh, of the show and that guy was phenomenal to work on he had done quite a few shows before and i he tells me jeremy you can't put anything on social media you can't do anything until the show comes out and i'm on facebook one day and i see california pools out in california like hey we're on pool kings and blah, blah. i forwarded over to randy and said randy what the hell what's going on and he calls me he's like i just got off the phone with hgtv and they had four other companies or three other companies do it they're having four shows because they really want to push this thing and, and see where it's going to go. He didn't even know at the time they already signed contracts with California Pools to do like four or five of them. Oh, really? <laughs> and so they were basically just using us to fill the spots mm. to put four shows out right away to catch, yeah, get to catch the, the attention, to catch the attention of people. So I was totally cool with it, and uh, I still think I'm not just saying because I was on it. I, the way that that show was produced for me, I love how he portrayed us. He, he portrayed us for what is important to me. And the guy did the research on my company where everyone else just, I think, went out there and shot a show. Sure. He actually did the research about me and got to know me and knew how important construction and integrity was. So when we went out there and did it, he focused on construction, integrity, showing how you're going to jump in a pool and fix something. Like none of that stuff was staged. There was not yeah. one thing on our show that was staged. Everything was, Jeremy, do what you do. We're going to catch it. And then yeah. we're going to ask you questions about it later. All right. You know, so well, we 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 watched that episode yesterday just to remind ourselves of it, and I think we both talked about it being like one of the cooler episodes because you do get into that structural side of it, and there's a couple errors that were made mm -hmm. with the light, and then some of the the uh, steel wasn't far enough away from the wall, things like that, and now the show is really kind of. You know, they don't get into all that stuff. So yeah, it was, it's still a cool show, but it's not like that structural, that the reason behind why you do things and the, how yeah. I think, you know, well you do things. It's that was portrayed much more in those episodes, you know, than that episode specifically than what there is now. Well, it was funny because I didn't want to mess up on TV. <laughs> yeah. One time I was like, I don't mess up. That's not what we do. <laughs> right. So Randy was, Randy was on it. He knew that if I was sitting there talking to my brother, like in the corner, hey, hey, hey. Uh, I saw that light over there, dude. We got to go run and fix that light before. And he would key in on it. And, get the cameras. Get the camera. He, he'd follow me around and he'd make me tell the story about what we had to do. But that guy was all over it. And then he, he knew. But, yeah, we had a few things that had happened in construction. And, of course, they were trying to slam it out as quick as possible. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Build, 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 build. And uh, so things, little things like that. But, yeah, I mean, that's what happens every single day. If you're not standing on your job sites watching this stuff, man, it'll come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah. And I think that show really, after getting to know you a little bit more, I think it really um, kind of mirrors your personality and the way you do things at Premiere. And I know that was, what, 2016? Mm, it finished up, uh, yeah, I think a, a memorial already. I filmed it in 2015 from uh, August through October. Oh, okay, okay. And, so then it released, and it released a memorial day. But it's crazy, even just over that span of time, you know, getting to know you, I um, think that that's pretty much what it is. I mean, even your, I was watching it with my wife again last night and I was just like, you know, this is, you know, the guy that we're going to be interviewing tomorrow. And I was just watching it. And I was like, that's so cool. And I was like, and I could tell that you were kind of sticking. Cause I watch a lot of the pool King show a lot and I pick up on their personality and the different things that they do. And I was like, man, I was like, he's very like serious about the job. I mean, you were having fun with it, but I could tell like you were very like, kind of like, hey, yeah, I'm joking. But like, at the end of the day, my priority is making sure this pool is built correctly. Yeah. And, of course, the Haboob, you know, it's oh, monsoon yeah. season that comes was, through. They couldn't have timed that any better. That, yeah. Oh, that, dude. That was legitimate. We were pouring concrete. And I looked over at Randy and I said, you know, if my luck is we're going to get one of these monsoon storms rolling. And I'm not even shitting you. 30 minutes later. Wind starts hitting and dude, it was kind of it was pretty bad. Yeah, it, was it, was quick, like, it was no joke. It was I ran quick. out to my truck because the water was coming in the house that they were building. It flooded the yard in a matter of no time. It was a monster storm. Yeah, and I was just joking. Yeah, and the thing totally hit and crushed us. <laughs> they made us refilm. 
uh, they because once they found out that the other guys were involved, they start they went and saw the show and saw everything else was kind of happy go lucky. Everything's perfect in the construction world. Look at our pool, and HGTV made them come back and refilm stuff because they said we were too serious. Oh really? And so you'll see a lot of the interviews where you see my hair was longer when I was mm. doing the pool building. Yeah, and yeah, some yeah. of the interviews later, I had a shorter haircut because that was six, yeah. like, or four months later. They came back January, February, and made us reshoot all the interviews. Oh wow! Like, Jeremy, be a little more upbeat. If you think you're being cheesy, that means you're perfect, and, and all this stuff. And um, but yeah, they made me refilm <laughs> yeah. some of that stuff. And that was the only thing that I could figure out why they might not think you were the best personality for it, but. I hate it. I hate even like thinking that because I was like, dude, you're what I want to see. Yeah. I want to see how serious the guy is that's building my my dream pool. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't want the yeah. jokester in my yeah. backyard, but at the same time, it is TV. But man, I, I tell you what, that episode was just awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Was, that. It yeah. was so much fun, and I really enjoyed yeah. the whole entire thing. I'd do um, it again. I'd do it again. I really would. I say I, I wouldn't, you know, because it takes <laughs> up so much time, but it's. I don't know. There's something to be said. It was it was a good time. So yeah. if you would have gotten picked up the way that you know California pools and I think Pete pools um, is on it, how would you have been able to? How does that work? I mean, you go out there and kind of get these pools and get the accounts, and then they just kind of film as you go. How does that yeah, even? Yeah. If if I landed that full time, I would have lost my company, guaranteed. I'm the only designer there. Um, I hired a sales guy last year, and he almost put me in the ground because that whole education thing that I'm huge on. He was trying to sell every client and they weren't having it. You know, I almost, I almost lost my ass last year because I hired a salesperson and not a designer. So I know that if I had to do that full time and I couldn't be there to meet clients and do my designs, the Premier Paradise wouldn't be here right now. So I have no issue doing another show once, you know, a year or something like that, but to be on the road doing all that stuff and missing the time for my kids and family and having to be that available for a, for a TV camera, it's just not in it for me, man. My, I, I still walk into backyards on leads to design, and I still get super excited after ten years of owning my own company doing it. And that, and that's where that's what it comes down to is when people see my excitement about building them something. That that I mean, I can see it on their face, you know. Yeah. And I, I can't step away from that. I had a failure on that project because of the service company. <laughs> really? Probably. <laughs> They turned one of my water features on high speed. You know those three cantilever water features yeah. I have? Well, I, I had the pro pump program to only be able to ramp up to a certain speed. Right. And they turned it on full blast. They disarmed everything. They put it how they wanted, turned it on full speed and left because it, it ran the cleaner or it ran the water features. And so when the customer turned on their water features, it was still on cleaner mode. And it mm -hmm. turned around and it flooded out those water features, took all the dirt around the, and put it down into their tennis court. And all my features went... Really? It sunk. We had to go out there with a crane, lift all the water features up, redo the thing, and drop them back down, and we got them all leveled out, and you never knew it even happened. Wow. <laughs> but who had to pay for that? Yep. <laughs> you. The Jeremy Nagel Foundation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you were showing the, the 3D version of what the pool is going to look like, they kept panning to yeah. it, and I noticed um, the color glass tile that was kind of all over, and then once the pool got built, um, it wasn't there. There was like a different type of, uh, yeah, we used a porcelain, um, out there instead. And that came down to budgets for the client. And also a lot of times when I design something, I have something in mind of what I would like to do. And then when material selections start happening, everything can change. When I start seeing directions of, uh, where the client's going, cause I designed that without a, without a house being there. Right. So after the client went through and did their house material selections, I started to see what they were doing, and it completely changed what I wanted to provide them with. And so that's that's why I I reopened it back up and, and changed their materials, their design. The the blue and red walls were always there, but the materials just had to change in order to fit the project correctly. And the guys painting it wrong that. <laughs> that was legit. <laughs> that was legit, and I was so mad because my office sent it over, and she doesn't work for me anymore, that girl that messed that up. Um not because of that. Yeah. But she, uh, yeah, she sent it over and I specifically said red here, blue there, sent it to the painters. They got to be here to do it. And so I'm sitting there doing a side interview, doing some B-roll with them, doing a side interview. And I look out of the corner of my eye and I see the walls blue and what's supposed to be red. And I'm <laughs> what the hell? And Randy again sees me. He goes, all right, we're on. He's like, don't, yeah. you're going to go there and explain that. He's like, this is on camera. You're yeah. doing this on camera. I said, no, Randy, no. And he goes, nope, you're doing it on camera. 
Yeah. And that was legit. That's man. awesome. That was 100% for real. Man, you guys think must it's have way had cooler so that fun. way, man. Yeah. The sh- I mean, I think the show is still cool, but I think it's more geared towards, yeah. you know, homeowner experience yeah. than anything. We all mess know. up, man. Things get messed up. Yeah. If you want to lie about it and act like everything's perfect, it's yeah. on you. But no matter how much detail I have on my plans, no matter what I do, things get messed up. People are people. Yeah. You know, for sure. Yeah. You can't do anything about that. So we're going to kind of get towards the end here, but um, just want to go into maybe some advice. So what advice would you give somebody that's looking to get, you know, into building swimming pools and where would you start that whole process? Um, just run far, far away, <laughs> far, far away. Cause you're going to be hooked. Um, no, educate yourself, you know, just nonstop educate yourself you can never stop learning i learn something every day i know it sounds cheesy everybody's doing these slogans nowadays you know you, if you think you know everything you you know you can't learn anything but it's it's it can't be any more true educate yourself apsp uh genesis no matter what it is picking up at the phone and calling somebody that that really knows their shit and getting shoot breaking bread with them spend money out of your pocket take them out to lunch Whatever it might be, just if you are just getting into pool building, you do not know anything. I don't care what you think you know. Right. I don't care how many, if you're a landscaper, if you're a home builder, and you watch some guy build a pool and say, well, I can schedule a few phases. All right. No, that one failure will end you. That one failure can end you. Um, just go and educate yourself. That's really all I could say. Um, for me, it was seeing what some other pool builders were doing. And and the people that I envy because I sat on Google forever looking at high end swimming pools, and I saw some Genesis members, and then that made me go to a forum, which made me go to, um, you know, start doing their classes. And I did one class and realized that I've been doing everything wrong, and everything I thought I learned at Presidential was completely wrong for the industry I wanted to be in. You know, sure. it was good for the cookie cutter what they're doing, but when it came to high end building and hanging stuff off the side of cliffs and whatnot. It's no joke. Right. You know, so if you if you want to get into something that's going to separate you from the rest of the industry and you really want to be a true custom swimming pool builder, you need to educate yourself in construction, design, everything, hydraulics. You need to just surround yourself with education. Thank you again for joining us. You know, we want to give you opportunity here to kind of talk about your company. Sure. Just let us know, you know, what where you guys can be found and stuff like that. Uh, you guys can find me at premierparadise.net. That's my website. Um, you can see the pictures we've done, learn, learn, learn a little bit about us on there. Uh, Instagram, Premier Paradise. Uh, Facebook's Premier Paradise. Everything's Premier Paradise. Um, and, you, and again, I, I, I learned a lot and I got a lot out of this business by reaching out to people and them opening the door and communicating with me. So if anybody listening has questions i don't care what stage of the game you're in i'm i'm an open book i'm super easy to talk to you can come to my office i'll talk to you if you want to call me on the phone i talk to people all the time about stuff so uh don't ever hesitate to reach out my email is jeremy at premierparadise.net and i spell my name completely incorrectly (laughs) so it's j-e-r O-M-E-Y at premierparadise.net. You can send me a question anytime. Uh, I'll call you, whatever you want. You know, I'm an open book. I'm here for the industry. I'm not here for myself. So, you know, please reach out if you need something. Yeah, we appreciate that. It makes a big difference, you know, and we talk about it on previous podcasts about giving, you know, back to the industry and being open and talking and like how it's difficult. You know, you walk, you said you worked at SEP when, you know, you hated the guys coming in there because they were so, you know, not approachable. And that's what we all deal with on a daily basis. I think when you're trying to learn, like we have no school, we have no nothing like that. So I think yeah. it's super cool for you to be open with that. And we because appreciate that. If we take care of each other and we learn from each other, we can all make a lot more money. Do it right the first time. Charge for it. Your your time is valuable. Mm -hmm. Charge for it. We can all get better at what we do. We can charge more money. We can have a a lucrative company, and we can better the industry at the same time. We need to raise that bar for sure. Raise it up. Get rid of the Johnny One trucks. Yeah, and and I want people that are better than me and and know more than me. Call me and and introduce yourself. I can learn from you. Let's let's do it. It's challenging, right? It challenges you. It makes you better anyway. Let's do it. Well, you're a huge inspiration, Jeremy, and it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, man. See you next time. All right.
Thank you guys so much for listening. We truly appreciate it once again, and we hope you enjoyed this episode with Jeremy. Um, as always, please take what you can, use it, apply it to your business. You know, we all get different things out of these podcasts and different things from different people. Take it, you know, dissect it and use it if you can. So we hope you enjoyed it. And as always, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If you have any questions, please email us at poolchasers.info at gmail.com. Thank you, guys. See See you out there, Pool pool chasers. Chasers.